go. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out uh, this evening to our city council meeting. This Tuesday, February. 22nd, which happens to be my wedding anniversary. So, oh, Lori, yeah. if you're watching, love you. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we will start with uh, a uh, roll call, please. Mayor McEachern? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Councilor Blaylock? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. I'd ask that you all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, no minutes to accept, so we are on to our most exciting part of the evening, uh, a recognition of the Portsmouth High School Girls Alpine Ski Team Division I State Champions. Yeah. So, Kaz, could you please stand up? Uh, thank you, Mayor McEachern, and welcome everybody, uh, Portsmouth City Councilors. Hello, <laughs> good evening. First off, happy anniversary. So <laughs> I'm glad you're here with us today. As you can see, I'm wearing my Clipper Pride jacket today, which means it's a great night for Portsmouth High School students. Uh, 2022 Alp Girls Alpine Ski uh, Champions. Uh, they actually etched out Bedford this year, who they lost to last year. So uh, these guys really, a lot of effort, a lot of working hard um, on, you know, on the mountain and off the mountain, uh, dry land training. Uh, they have a great coaching staff, and um, we're really proud of them. And we actually got, I know, I saw Chief Newport in here somewhere. Thank you, sir. He uh, actually provided the escort again for us to go through downtown. So you might have heard us on Valentine's Day with sirens and horns and everything like that. And it was a lot. Actually, I was on the bus that year, that time. So it was a lot of fun for the girls, and I know we were all having a good time. So um, without further ado, I know I, um, I'm going to have Coach Kyle Harrison come on up. And he'll help you hand out the plaques, and we'll get the girls up here. So. Uh, first up is Hannah McHugh. <laughs> Sophie Williams. Sammy Walker. Aiden Beeland. <laughs> Ella Barlock. Anya Bake. Evan Martin. Eve Hurley. Scarlett Graham. Amanda Scally. <laughs> Ashley Robertson. <laughs> Our team captain, Brady Beeland. Uh, is Ryan here? Assistant Coach Ryan Osella. I don't know. I didn't see him. All right. Uh, Assistant Coach Kim Dedeos. Uh, 
Kim's going to make a speech right now. <laughs> 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 and head coach Kyle Harrison. And if I could just finish off, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much, Mayor McEachern, Council of Blaylock. They joined me a couple of weeks ago, jumping into the ocean for New Hampshire Special Olympics and the Penguin Plunge. You guys rock. Hopefully, we can get everybody doing it next year, right? Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a as great day. As long night. as it's 55 degrees again. Go <laughs> You're more than welcome to stay. You don't have to. <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. We have homework. We have homework. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you should vote against homework. <laughs> All right, next up we have um, public comment. I'd ask that um, I will go through the, uh, the names here. Um, uh, on uh, on the signups um, and we don't have uh, as many so we'll all have uh, three minutes and then if you do want to speak on zoom I just ask that you raise your hand now uh, over the next minute we'll cap that um, and then we'll go through zoom uh, ask uh, uh, to have um, uh, residents uh, speak first but uh, first up is uh, Mr. Jeff Goss <clears throat> Can I take this down? Okay. Sure, yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. My name again is Jeff Goss. I'm here to speak on outdoor... And just uh, your, your address for the record, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm at 123 Market Street in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of outdoor dining, um, about outdoor dining, on behalf of the Clipper Tavern. Um, looking what is going to be proposed to the City Council tells me a lot of things. Number one, some restaurants will be left out. My question is why? We are a city that has talked so much over the past few years about making Portsmouth a walking city, and yet now we don't want to divert traffic. The Clipper Tavern was the first restaurant to have barriers put down, and we made the commitment to do much more than put out tables and chairs. We spent thousands of dollars to make the area look great and something the city would be proud of. We forced other restaurants to up their game and do the same thing. We paid thousands to add a service station in the front of the restaurant to help with the service for these customers outside. We pay for a storage unit to store all of these items during our off season. I know that some of the CDC regulations have subsided and some of the COVID mandates have gone away, but the battle is not over. We have staff that relies on this summer income. We have seasonal staff that we will not be able to rehire without the dining. Labor is way up. A $15 employee is now $22 an hour. Food costs in some instances as dairy, chicken, beef, lobster have doubled in price. How much can you pass on to the customer? I think we have reached a limit on how much we can. A burger should be $22 at these rates but we are a tavern and know we need to have a reasonable price. Lease payments and overhead have not been reduced in any way. We tried to negotiate our lease extension, uh, but had to accept the renewal that was already in place, which went up significantly. We have taken loans, not PPP funds, 
to survive the slow times. And now the light at the end of the tunnel may be taken away. The Clipper Tavern location may be the most benign location in the city that is affected by any of this. Zero parking is lost and little to no inconvenience to traffic. The current pricing that you are putting out there is too high. It'll take away all the profit that we need to survive. Are we looking to help the business or put businesses out of business? The current setup as, as proposed will just allow the rich to get richer. I, pro I propose a flat fee of $3,500 and payable monthly, just like any other lease space is paid. Rerouting traffic again, why? What were the issues in the past? It's an easy transition at our location with little inconvenience to have a car turn left or right at the corner of Pleasant and Court and get right back onto their route in, within 50 yards. Isn't closing the left lane on Congress Street a slight inconvenience? But that's what it is. It's inconvenient, uh, but it has to be done in order to help these restaurants survive. Thank you, Jeff. I, we it. appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Next up is Bill St. Laurent, topic of cargo at Pease. Good evening, Mayor, City Councilors. Congratulations for your election. Um, I'm here tonight, and I'm glad to see that it, that Bill, it's I just, also- Bill, I'm sorry, I just need you to state your name and your, and your oh, address. Oh, Bill St. Laurent, 253 Colonial Drive in Fort Smith. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm here, and I'm glad to see it on the agenda tonight, uh, discussion on the uh, new cargo areas that are going on or proposed for peas. Uh, I want to, uh, I, I am the noise, a member of the Noise Compatibility Committee since 1990 uh, at Pease for my neighborhood, the Sherman Civic, Asso Sherman Civic Association neighborhood. Um, I also would like to bring up that you have a representative, supposedly have a representative on this committee that's supposed to be reporting to you, and it was Peter Brasiano at the time, and I don't know, I haven't heard the high and the hair of him for a long time, so I don't know if he's still on there, and it would be nice if you would uh, select somebody eventually to go on that committee so you'll have a contact. Um, right now you can use me uh, as, a, as a contact. Um, this is a major effort that's going on at Pease, or it's going to happen at Pease. Uh, I might, I don't have a lot of time here, so I'll just bring up some major things. Um, uh, airport, like in Manchester, has 200,000 square feet of cargo area and 100,000 square feet for repairs. This is going to be 400,000 square feet and 300,000 for uh, repairs. This is, this is quite a huge major, and uh, I'm of the understanding that in an article in the, in the paper that, this, that uh, these planes don't fly at night, they fly in the daytime. Well, that's not true. That's when they fly is at night because they're doing their packing and, and loading their planes and whatever. So this is, this is going to be a major thing for our neighborhood, for Portsmouth, Greenland. Uh, they're all getting on the bandwagon. So I'm asking you as the city council to be very uh, cognizant of what's going on and probably maybe uh, if uh, Councilman Tabor and Councilman Lombardi can make a, you know, put a lot, lot of effort into this because after the, yes, the, the issue that we went through with, um, with the helicopters, okay. that's nothing compared to what I see going to be happening here. Um, so I guess the idea that I'm he here for is to recognize, make you recognize that this is going to be a major effort and uh, Portsmouth Tends to, would have a tendency to be really impacted great, a great deal by this. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Next up, we have Eric Anderson also speaking on the cargo uh, PDA. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm from 38 George's Terrace in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Presently, I act as your representative on the PDA Board of Directors. I take this responsibility seriously and with the intent to be as transparent in all matters that have concern with the city and its relationship with the PDA. My purpose here this evening is to solicit your engagement into the recently announced and media reported development project at the trade port steered at e-commerce activity. I've tried to dialogue with you um, in a variety of ways, but took this opportunity also to convey my message to you to hopefully be cognizant and engage in this development. Um, what I feel is most important is that um, any announced development remains visible in all regards with engagement of the surrounding communities to assure that any impacts are thoroughly recognized and investigated and to assure compatibility and alignment to the values and the qualities of our community. While this evening's agenda includes a report from Councilor Tabor and Councilor Lombardi on PDA activities, I trust that they will, as I, will do our best to keep you appraised of this project. At this moment, it's in its preliminary stages by developers Kane Incorporated and Procon Incorporated. On many different aspects to be considered and required for it to be further reviewed by the PDA. In a presentation made by both companies at the January PDA meeting, the size and scope of this project, when fully built out, in opinion, is very significant. With that significance and purpose, it will be undoubtedly, it will undoubtedly increase aeronautical and ground traffic activity in this community. A most important ingredient to this discussion is that it is presently unknown who the end user or uh, end user company or companies will be to the 700,000 plus square foot warehousing facilities to be constructed. As a suggestion, I think it would be beneficial to the city council at, a, at the discretion of the mayor to have a similar presentation made to you so that you could assess its scope, its assets, and potential inc impacts with questions of any concern and adding to the public transparency of the process. As earlier stated, this is an exciting project that deserves understanding and attention by all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And thank you to your service to your city on the PDA. Uh, next up is Gretchen Rath, subject outdoor dining. Good evening. I want to thank Karen Kennard and her team for developing. Oh, pardon me. I, oh, Gretchen I just have to... Rath, 112 Penhallow Street. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I want to thank Karen Kennard <clears throat> and her team for developing the outdoor dining proposal. I support the fees that have been proposed. Downtown merchants, restaurant owners, and retailers were subjected to COVID restrictions starting March 2020. Restaurants and shops were closed for a period. Businesses that were able to turn to curbside pickup did so, whether a restaurant or a retailer. When businesses reopened, there were occupancy restrictions recommended by the CDC and the state for restaurants and retailers. Restaurants and retailers were given opportunities to find financial assistance with federal and state grants and loans, such as PPP, Main Street Fund, and SBA assistance, to name a few. These were offered to restaurants and retailers alike. The City of Portsmouth implemented outdoor dining in early 2020 and gave aid to restaurants by giving them the free use of 69 public parking spaces and in 2021, they gave 76 public parking spaces. The city lost more than 300,000 each year for the past two years by giving up these public parking spaces to restaurants at no cost to them. Retailers were given no such help. In fact, the loss of parking downtown could be perceived as compounding the retailer's struggle to bring customers to their shops. There were many scenarios that could be described as traffic nightmares issues with trucks finding enough loading zones to drop off goods and double parking, streets narrowed to one lane congesting tr traffic flow, or customers circling the block for parking where there was none. 
There were several occasions where the parking spaces that were given over to restaurants were not in use until the evening hours, empty tables taking up valuable parking space, frustrating shoppers even more. As the city manager stated when she presented the proposal, it will not be equitable. What it is, though, is a step in the right direction in getting more equitable. The local taxpayer should not be funding the loss of parking revenue. If one parking meter brings the city an estimated $1,000 a month on average, the season from April to November cited in this proposal would bring an estimated $8,000 per parking space. The fee of $5,700 per parking space is a step in the right direction. There are no restrictions in place right now. <clears throat> the fee should not be lowered. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gretchen. Next up, we have Sue Polidora, also on outdoor dining. Sue Polidora, 245 Middle. And I just wanted to um, reiterate what Gretchen said in many ways. There are many parking spaces. There is outdoor dining is, in some cases, makes sense. Like popovers, they have their own area that they can extend. It's a sidewalk. The other places require to take over other parking spaces, which are a premium during that uh, time of the year. So I'm thinking the equitable uh, to make it equitable, we are also going in the right direction because if we're going to focus on only restaurants, what about those other businesses that do not deal in food that are retailers? Are they going to be given some sort of access to a special parking for their own, um, for their shops? And, and so we got to move into the equitable arena quite cautiously to make sure that we are not extending extending this far beyond what it needs to be. We had uh, some critical needs in the last two years. Those seem to be subsiding, so we need to be keep the needs of the regular business owners in Portsmouth to their needs and also traffic patterns. There were several locations down on Congress Street that it was like, the, the traffic, the way that it, it, it just had to be redirected uh, was almost ridiculous, actually. So we need to keep that in mind when we reauthorize this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. <clears throat> Next up, we have Kevin Dwyer, also on Outdoor Dining. My name is uh, Kevin Dwyer. I live at 461 Middle Street in Portsmouth and own Dwyer's Pub on uh, Bridge Street in Portsmouth as well. Uh, I spoke a few weeks ago in support of continuing outdoor dining and would just like to restate my support of the program and how much it's done for my business during the ups and downs it's experienced over the past two years due to the pandemic. I uh, love the opportunity to work with the city to find ways that could make sense uh, to continue our outdoor patio and appre appreciate what you've done thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, uh, we have Rick Beckstead under Just the Facts. Good evening, once again. Rick Beckstead, 1395 Islington Street. Just a simple couple of facts. Um, I would strongly urge that you not move forward with the DSA agreement, parking agreement. I'm not so sure if you have been brought up to speed. Um, I lived that project from beginning to end from lot six, which stands directly across from the Foundry Place garage where we lost two uh, workforce housing uh, units. Uh, it were two duplexes that were torn down with promises being made. Uh, promises being made that there would be five uh, workforce housing units in lot five, which sits on the corner on Maplewood. And that was sold. And lot four was sold. And I truly believe that lots three and six will be sold. The mayor and Councilor Tabor both know my concerns as well as the other councilors' concerns. I look at this agreement, it doesn't look anything beneficial for the city of Portsmouth. Still don't even see the simple fact that if you go and you honor this tonight and allow the city manager to move forward with this agreement, that they are rescinding the lawsuit. 
I guess it would be my hopes that at least that would happen and we get something out of it. But what you're going to do is you're going to lose 68 spaces forever. 68 spaces that not just Mr. Rogers and DSA will be able to go and use, but I believe that they're going to sell it like they did with the other two lots. They can use it as collateral. They can borrow against those 68 units. It's transferable with those two properties on lots three and six. And the one real big concern that I have is lot two, which is the community space, which was used for lots three and six to be able to go up a story higher than what our zoning requires. 4,000 square feet was used for each one of the 8,000. And what most people don't know is, is we paid $800,000 for that lot. And it sits. But we don't have the deed and we don't have anything to it. Mr. Rogers had an out. He either gave us, which was now, Bob, I think two years ago, he had the ability to go and either give us $800,000 back so he could keep lot two or hand us the deed. Now, in 2020, shortly after my council was elected, we were told that there was a force majeure that was actually put in place. I didn't know what a force majeure was. I'm not the lawyer. Bob is. But with that being said, they basically put a stead on that for an additional two years, which is coming up next year. Uh, 23, I believe, Bob, it was two years to be able to go and do either we get back our $800,000 or we get the deed. Negotiate. You have the ability and power. We did negotiate. It wasn't done. We were in the middle of it. I asked the mayor and I asked Councilor Tabor to go and table this, educate the council, tell the truth on what's there so that this council can make a conscious decision. What's in the best interest of the city? You all work for the residents. I'm a resident, you are residents, but you represent us. But just because there's a simple lawsuit doesn't mean we cave into everything. There's things that are worth fighting for. I lived six years with this project. This is something to fight for. Please don't give it away. Do the right thing for Portsmouth. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next up, uh, Victor Huda on FY23 budget, uh, Tabor motion, Denton motion. Got three minutes. I didn't even get up here yet. <laughs> oh, no. That's Good evening, right. Councilor. All right. Council and Mayor McGeckern. First one is a question. What oh, is, name and address. Uh, Petra Huda, 280 South Street. What is the FY23 budget guidance that was given to the, by the city council to the city manager? As a taxpayer, I'd like to know if it was 5%, 10%. We have um, no transparency to that yet. That was my first thing. Next one is on Councilor Tabor's motion. I am requesting that the City Council table this motion until this council and the public have had a presentation to clarify what the taxpayer dollars are being committed by signing this contract to be a contributor to this corporation. This motion appears to commit taxpayer dollars in the form of using city staff to create a new city-run utility without a public hearing. See the contract, page four, article five, cost sharing principles. This is committing money. In effect, a vote on this contract will commit all of the ratepayers to this contract without their consent. My next is a question. How can you move forward on this motion when the costs to the taxpayers are unknown? All the cost sharing for this contract depend on the number of participants plus the added cost to the taxpayers of creating staffing and other municipal, in, in another municipal department. Next question, who will make the selection or choose which providers will be available to Portsmouth taxpayers? A non-elected committee on the taxpayer's behalf. Having been one of the city council members who did attend this work session in June, um, and I could tell you who was there and who wasn't, um, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> uh, my interpretation of this motion is to commit all Portsmouth tax rate, tax rate payers um, to the startup costs associating with establishing a utility. And I believe the main clause that the taxpayers, rate payers need to know, need to be clear on is this vote will automatically switch you into this new utility. When it's created, you have to opt out. The ability to make a provider choice currently exists for everyone in the state. This action would take away that individual freedom and, and freedom to choose a provider unless you opt out. Uh, next, I'm going to go to um, Councillor Denton's motion. 
Councillor Denton, you have connected two entirely different motions with the word and here. Um, and I, th I believe each one needs to be on its own to accomplish two different things. As a taxpayer, I object to the first motion on outdoor dining fees. Move to amend having the city's proposed dining fees. This question requires a public hearing before the city council even considers the vote. There are only two sources of revenue to cover operations of this city, property taxes and other revenues. These fees are other revenues. So when you decrease the other revenue sources, the dollars have to be made up someplace. And it's going back to the taxpayer again. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Bill Downey on the subject of McIntyre. We have Bill. Oh, he's coming. Oh, he's coming. All right. Yep. <laughs> there he goes again. There he goes. <laughs> Here he comes. Here he comes. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. So tonight I'd like to speak about the McIntyre. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Durham situation where they have a dam. Some people call it the dam dam. So there's two sides to this argument. Some people want to remove it. Some people want to preserve it. But I don't know if any of you guys caught the letter from a fellow named uh, Jeffrey Hiller today in the, in the, the Herald. So I thought it was reflective of what we're experiencing right now. And the title is, Something is Dirty in Durham, and It's Not the Mill Pond. Democracy, by definition, is government by and for the people. At the very core of democracy is implicit principle of fairness. Democracy, its very existent, depends on the truth. Sadly, I see Durham leaders attempting to place their thumb on the scale. I feel that we're experiencing the same thing here in our city. That he goes on to say, there's two parties, one wants to remove, one doesn't. The prices are very similar in 1.5 million. But the city has implied that's an additional four to five million dollar tab. It's highly unlikely, it's actually improbable that that will ever happen. But he goes on to argue and say, why would this be? He says, sadly, they're perpetuating a narrative that is in their own best interests. Now, with all due respect, I've heard the argument there's tens of millions of dollars of exposure. As you know, I've had the pleasure of having my own consult with a group that says otherwise. I would argue, Mr. Sullivan, if that was a valid case, they would not be waiting this long to go on with this lawsuit. That it was leveraged effectively, but unfortunately it was levered during this election. And I felt like there was some misrepresentation in some comments. To say that there is some kind of interlocking kind of Rubik's Cube legalities, but yet a tiny baby step was going to unplug this, just doesn't square up. It was also mentioned that there was no intent that this action to rescind was not going to lead to any specific thing. I don't believe that to be accurate or genuine. I think this is all predicated on the idea, avoiding a potential lawsuit, but however, I don't think we got the honest skinny on this. And um, how much time do I have? 27 seconds. Okay. Just in summary, sorry I don't have more time. Mayor, in this format, unfortunately, you get the last word. And you know I enjoy going back and forth with you. And your rebuttal was that you've always followed the council to listen to council. But I think there's an addition. Like any good attorney or medical advisor, to get a second opinion and be skeptical. So I encourage all you people to follow council, be open-minded, but have critical thinking skills in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Next up, we have uh, Allison Tanner on community power. My name is Allison Tanner. I live at 380 Greenleaf Avenue in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I am a resident for 45 years. And I think that it's time that this city took the opportunity to look at community power in that we're, we would not be required to pay anything initially. We're just looking at the opportunities. What it does is it increases the possibilities for the, the people that live in the city 
and it enables us to have a say, a voice in government, in state government, regarding um, lobbying for initiatives to support renewable energy installations and to uh, support rebates for uh, having your home insulated. And all, the, all of these things are reflected to help to decrease climate change. There are, as I said, no costs incurred just to sign up. It's a wait and see thing. Uh, we would look at the different brokerages that are available to potentially reduce the, the amount of money that's spent um, for each resident in the city of Portsmouth on their power. And um, it also has you the opportunity to increase the amount of renewable energy sources that are used to produce the power that we need. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, and last, uh, do we have any speakers on Zoom? Two on Zoom. We have two on Zoom. Last in the room, uh, we have Cliff Lazenby, uh, topic November 18th. <clears throat> Hello, Cliff Lazenby, 303 McKinley Road. Good evening, Mayor, City Councilors, City Manager, Attorney, and Clerk. It's nice to see you all. Um, while my primary topic is the November 18th meeting, I do want to quickly voice support Amen. for joining the- Oh, sorry, name and address, Cliff. I started off. Yeah, okay. That's all right. Oh, all right, blame that on the city manager. Um, so I do want to quickly voice support for joining the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire. <laughs> I previously served on the Energy Advisory Committee and was on the Sustainability Committee who initially brought forth community power to the city of Portsmouth. There is much to gain by moving forward. I hope Portsmouth does. As to November 18th, I agreed with your February 10th decision to rescind the actions of the November meeting. Regardless of whether we can work things out with Redgate Kane, the legal advice from our experienced and qualified counsel is that steps taken November 18th were hurtful not helpful to the McIntyre project in the city. However, there was more about that November meeting that is of serious concern, important factors yet to be acknowledged or confronted by the city and the city council. There were lines crossed in how that meeting was conducted by the Portsmouth mayor and the city council in terms of the right to know law, in reference to city council rules, in terms of being open and honest with the people our city council is sworn to represent. While on the February 10th agenda you listed the Doug Roberts lawsuit, the topics it legitimately called out remain unaddressed. If we're going to learn from those mistakes to heal and move on, we need to face what happened and make efforts to improve. Perhaps more concerning, but at least as urgent about November 18th, was how it pointed a spotlight on shortcomings of our current rules and laws. There were steps taken that night that tested limits and revealed things that might currently be legal but probably should not be. The, perhaps the most alarming example, five individuals had the power to block the city council from hearing legal, legal counsel on a serious and impactful motion. Once the unannounced motion was made, the city attorney implored the council to recess to hear legal advice. We knew that we couldn't act responsibly without hearing that advice. Yet with their five votes, they forced the Portsmouth City Council to act without transparently weighing the ramifications of their actions. In your existing laws, in a public meeting, any counselor can ask for legal advice. Even a criminal being charged of serious uh, offenses has rights to an attorney. How can we let five counselors block even one city counselor from legal advice on a sensitive topic and non-public? Our city hadn't addressed this issue before because we didn't need it. It was inconceivable that the city council would vote to block the city council from hearing legal advice. But plainly, plainly we saw that that can happen. I hope you could commit to doing this necessary work and wish you peace and resolve as you do so. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. All right, we have two names, Mayor. First is Robert Smith. Robert, please state your name. And your address? Uh, Robert Smith, 240 McKinley Road. I'd just like to speak about the, um, I guess it goes under several things, the sidewalks in Elm Park and the safe routes to school. First, I want to say um, I am very for safe routes to school. Um, 
I for traffic calming. Um, I'm not convinced we need sidewalks in Elwin Park as of yet. Uh, I think there are other things that can be done uh, before going through the cost and expense of digging up people's yards and um, uh, taking from the roads um, things like uh, flashing signs. Um, we can install speed humps, bumps, whatever you want to call them. Um, when I look at the um, one of the diagrams, uh, I, I'm still not convinced where any of these sidewalks would go. Nobody's been ever to, been able to say exactly where they want to put them. It's just uh, they target McKinley Road, uh, Van Buren. Um, they totally ignore uh, Hoover Drive, which probably has a, no more than four houses with drive drive uh, ways that uh, exit onto Hoover. Um, there's plenty of room for buses and parents to travel down that road take a left on the Taft Road, there's an access road that goes uh, right to the school off of Garfield Road. Plenty of room for kids to ride their bikes, walk in. Uh, parents already use that to drop their kids off, pick them up after school. So I just feel that um, we need to hold off on the sidewalks, do other things, and we need to have more discussion and definitive um, um, ideas of where these things are going. Um, so again, I'm for uh, safe routes to school. Um, I see another diagram that seems to imply that if we put these in, we're gonna get uh, kids riding their bikes and walking to school from probably as far out as uh, the McKinnon's area and down near Tucker's Cove. I'm not convinced of that. I think parents are still gonna continue to drive their kids to school. Uh, but we have a bigger issue of, of just speed in the area, um, not only from parents dropping their kids off, but also from residents. So I'd like to see some of those measures done before we start putting sidewalks in. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next, we have Marie Bodie. Could you please uh, state your name and address? Hello, yes, Marie Bodie with um, 121 State Street in Portsmouth. I'm also representing as an employee of McNabb Properties. And I would like to thank um, the mayor, city manager and council for, I respect the time that you are taking to evaluate the fees associated with outside dining. And I am sure that you've all seen the letter as written by Mark McNabb concerning his um, perspective on fees and the elaborateness of what had been proposed. Um, as you know, we continue to demonstrate in our development projects in downtown the um, extra expense on providing wider sidewalks for outside dining within the restaurants that we own. We believe wholeheartedly in the need for traffic calming. And we, again, in developing projects have done extensive landscape. And I think even in the past year with the outside dining at the Rosa restaurant, Etc. it was evident that we spent a little bit more time, energy, and money on making the outside dining more beautiful. Um, as you take this very spectacular opportunity to improve the vibrancy of our downtown already, we encourage you to also be considering for the future um, how trash can be remedied in this setting and in future developments. And um, we believe that this can be a revenue neutral opportunity with regard to the parking and loss of revenue and perhaps reevaluating the use of Parrot Lot and charging for parking there. With that, I thank you again for your time and have a good evening. Thank you, Marie. Uh, and we have one last speaker, Anna Corcoran. Anna, could you please state your name and address for the record? Uh, yep, my name's Hannah. I live at 85 Albany Street uh, in Portsmouth. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of, uh, I work at the GOAT, and um, we, you know, we wanted to say thank you to the City Council for uh, creating the, op uh, the option for outside dining. We uh, saw a big influx of people coming in during the COVID time feeling comfortable to sit outside, and it really helped our business, and not just our business, but a lot of the restaurant businesses survive during that time. Had we not had that, um, it could have gone a much different direction. So we, I mostly just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Hannah. All right, with that, 
We will close uh, public comment. Um, next up is public hearings and vote on ordinances. Um, first, uh, a continued public hearing uh, of the capital improvement plan, uh, the CIP. We will, no presentation uh, this evening, um, but happy to hear, right? There's no, we don't have a presentation. Right. Okay. Um, uh, anybody with comment uh, on the capital improvement plan? Uh, we've kept the public hearing open. Uh, please step up to the microphone. No, we don't. Get as much as you want, but just mentally think of three minutes. Yes. <laughs> <in your head. laughs> A long three minutes. Uh, good evening, Mayor McKecker and counselors and city staff. I'm Effie Malley from 428 Pleasant Street in Portsmouth. I'm here tonight to speak in support of project number 21 in the Capital Improvement Plan, the Climate Action Plan. From municipalities who have gone before us, we know elements that make a climate action plan successful. Support from the city. The average city spends less than half of 1% on climate action. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second, a plan with actionable steps and accountable performance measures. And thirdly, technical guidance to define targeted emissions levels. The Climate Action Plan ties to our city's master plan goal number five that addresses sustainability and moving towards net zero carbon emissions, as well as supporting other goals. I hope you'll support the capital funding in the CIP for the Cap Climate Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Effie. Yep, uh, or folks, Petra, are you lining up back there? Oh, okay. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, City Manager Connor, City Attorney Bob Sullivan. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard. My name is Rich Brabazon. I live at 260 McKinley Road, and I'm here to speak about the issue of Elwyn Park sidewalks in the CIP. I am not in favor of moving the Elwyn Park calming measure, or traffic calming measure, from 2000 fiscal year 24 and 25 to bring it back to fiscal year 23 with a $1.6 million bond. Here are some of the reasons why I feel this way. It is fiscally irresponsible the 2010 Safe Routes to Study school study and the 2019 study both discuss calming measures that should be taken ahead of sidewalks. Even though the city adopted the 2010 plan, none of these measures have been taken and the, uh, they are much less expensive than sidewalks. These measures include lighted signs for crosswalks in school zones. Currently, there are only a couple of signs stating pedestrian crossing. There are no school zone signs, or should I say, when I say no school signs, some of them are barely legible or readable. There are no lighted signs, not even one flashing yellow light when school is open, opening or closing. Also mentions the sidewalks in the study, also mentioned are raised sidewalks with reflectors and better signage. <clears throat> Many of the roads, including Fillmore and Van Buren, and Adams at Van Buren, don't even have a sidewalk. Never mind a brightly painted, reflected or lit one with any signage. Both studies suggest bike paths. The 2019 study suggests a bike path with reflectors where there would be no parking during school hours. The current path where I live on McKinley Road is just one line down the road on each side of the street. We, I believe, along with many other neighbors, have invested, that I've seen in the neighborhood and talking to neighbors, have invested significant money in our driveways 
to double them in width. This allows us to park additional cars to get them off the roadway. If the sidewalks are built by taking five feet of city's egress to build it on our front lawn, we will not be able to park behind each other without infringing on the sidewalk. In the other two cars, well, they'll probably end up in the street. Not to mention that they would be, I would be losing part of my lawn, which I greatly love. It is very easy to be in, sport, to, to be in support of theoretical sidewalks when they are on the other side of the street. But until it's actually in your front yard, you may not really understand the problem. We see people walking all the time in front of our house. Many times there are large groups. Almost no one uses the multi-use path that is in front of the house. And I'm referring to that white line, which was the bike lane. I don't foresee large groups using the sidewalk either, but it will push them further into the street. Bicycles will also be forced closer to the road since they won't be using the, use, the uh, uh, multi-use path that will become a sidewalk. When we walk around in Elwyn Park, there's a loop and sometimes it takes us into the woodlands. We can only use the sidewalk sometimes because they've deteriorated so poorly. They are not kept up. Most times they are dangerous. You can barely walk on them or, or even run if you wanted to run on them. There is no reason for me to believe that this side, that our sidewalks, which would be put in in Elwyn Park, would be any different. If the main concern, and I do believe the concern, is slowing down traffic and keeping people safe, which I am in favor of that, once again, there has been no fiscally more responsible options have been tried or recommended in both studies. There are no speed humps or flashing lights, minimal signing, including school zone signs, except for normal speed limit. There are very few crosswalks and none that are painted bright, lit up, or have reflectors. Occasionally, we get that speed monitor put on the, pole, the telephone pole by the Traffic and Safety Committee, <clears throat> thanks to our great police department, in front of our house. It flashes when your car is coming by, but it doesn't tell you to slow down if you're going over the limit. It's really not understandable, maybe, to many drivers. So in a, a letter that I submitted to the council with an attachment was from the police department. And there was a credit, and then what, and then the request was for accidents in Elwyn Park. Over the last 10 years, and I've lived in Elwyn Park since the early 1990s, and having worked for the police department, I can tell you that this, the report that I have is of 10 years. There have been 18 total accidents, 12 of which occurred on Lafayette Road, Route 1, on, near McKinley. There was only one accident that involved personal injury, and it was not a pedestrian. It was a bicycle driving into a car. So I thank you very much for your time and consideration with my request. Please consider more fiscally responsible alternatives before moving this to the 2023 fiscal year CIP. Thank you and have a pleasant evening. Thank you, Richard. Good evening again. Um, I'm Peter, here. just your name and address again for the record. Okay. Peter Huda, 280 South Street. Thank you. Okay. In following uh, the budget meetings for fire, police, and school, um, I have, I'm going to come forward with new information that I would request of the council. Um, I am also looking for answers to the questions that I posed to the council last session. 
um, on the CIP based on statements made from the police budget. From a taxpayer perspective, a more realistic positioning of the police station with an estimated cost of 40.6 million would be FY26. Um, last year, the police department was allocated 1.4 million to complete the new facility study. The study has not even been started. In the, in the budget session of the police, um, the chief was asked um, about how long would it take to build the police station if the study had been completed. And the answer was about three years. So what I'm asking as a taxpayer is not to put this burden on the taxpayers next year or until you get a good estimate on what this should actually be. <coughs> the next thing I'd like to talk to you about is the $400,000 listed for the next six years. It totals $2 million in the police budget for mold remediation. As a taxpayer, I am requesting more transparency into what is actually being funded with this money each year. The initial request was for mold remediation, but it seems to have been reallocated to other projects. And according to <coughs> the chief, the mold problem still exists. The funding, be the funding between the needed city hall HVAC upgrades that's in the F FY26 budget, which is the root cause of this, seems to be blurred. We have money in both the city hall and in the police budget for both of these. I ask you to stop putting a Band-Aid on the mold issue that's occurring in the basement and please fix the root cause of this, which is the HVAC system. It would save the taxpayers at least a half a million dollars if this was moved forward and not Band-Aided for the next six years. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, Christina Dubin, 336 Miller Ave in Portsmouth. Um, short and sweet, I just want to voice my support for a climate action plan um, and the funding um, that it will take to do so. In my role at the Sustainability Institute at UNH, I interact with their climate action plan often, uh, Wildcap, and so I just know um, how useful of a tool it is even when it's done to draw from for short and long-term planning. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. It's a race. Hmm. Good evening, Cliff Lazenby, 303 McKinley Road. I'm here to speak about the uh, Ellen Park neighborhood improvements. Um, not here to encourage you to move ahead with them because I think we should. I am here to encourage you to do it because for uh, more than a dozen years, the city has engaged in a pretty thorough, rigorous public process that recommends that doing so is a good idea. And that includes significant and thorough input from uh, the residents of Elwyn Park uh, to the tune of nearly 80% of those residents. I did want to give a little quick history, just perspective on it, and also the nature of this particular kind of project and why it's a little challenging. In 2010, when that Safe Routes to School study was conducted, uh, my wife Stephanie actually took part in that group because we had a daughter in kindergarten. We had a three-year-old who was a couple years behind. Uh, this past weekend, I had the joy of spending time with that kindergarten daughter when she was home from college, and it's been taking We've gone through, and my younger daughter's next year will be a senior at Portsmouth High School. And through those years, we've identified in the Safe Fruits to School study that it was not only necessary, but it was deficient compared with the other two elementary schools, New Franklin and Little Harbor. Uh, we did a, a bike ped master plan that also put these uh, improvements as a necessary and valid um, improvement that was important for the whole city. We talk about the city being bikeable and walkable, um, but this area and this school and those children and their families have been left behind. Um, it's been a good process. It's been inclusive. It, we've, we, the survey of the residents was uh, just over two years ago, in late 2019. We've had numerous 
public meetings uh, in the neighborhood uh, that were open. There were other avenues for people to give input. I know you have a, a petition in your packet, which I respect people to uh, provide their input, but those 11 individuals uh, represent about 6.5% compared to uh, the numbers of folks who, who indicated support in the survey. Um, I, did, I, I do think, and one of the reasons I want to speak up today was I think that the imbalance uh, of the experience for the families and children for Dondero compared to the other two schools is really worth emphasis because Safe Routes to School, I think, is the big driving factor. It's not the only one. People in our neighborhood want to get to urban forestry, and that's, that's very tricky if you would try and walk down uh, Harding Road. But um, in the time that we've done these studies, not only have the good uh, bike ped um, facilities that are available to students at Little Harbor have they existed, but capital improvements have been done to the existing facilities there, and yet we haven't moved, we haven't, as a city, moved the process ahead. So I, I applaud Councillor Bagley for not only uh, supporting it in the CIP, but moving it ahead. It's, it's taking an awful long time. And then finally, I think the nature of this issue it is more urgent when you when you have kids, right? So that's why we did get involved because our kids, because we were experiencing it. That line that the gentleman talked about on McKinley Road, if there's a car parked in that line or if there's snow on the road or if it's high traffic, there's nothing safe about that painted line on the road. So you just don't, you end up not doing it. And so it seems you're like, wow, how can we do this? How, what, how can we not have this? And so it's urgent. But after six or seven or eight or 10 years of doing it, people burn out on that. And so new families, there's new families coming into the neighborhood just like every other neighborhood. So I hope the rest of our neighbors will consider that it is more urgent when you have kids and the kids that are gonna to go to that school, but also you as a council, when you're thinking about the process, remember the nature of this issue and think about the fact it's not going away. The reasons why people have spoken up for it won't go away next year or the year after or 10 years or if my kids if my grandkids are still are in the neighborhood and we haven't done it yet so i support you moving it forward as a priority um, to show that dondero kids and their families matter just as much as everybody else and it should be a that priority should speak in your capital investment plan thank you thank you cliff Good evening again, Rick Beckstead, 1395 Visiting Street. I uh, just want to, uh, I guess, point out again a fact. I'm going to be sticking with facts. So I did see on the agenda that uh, Councillor Bagley was proposing, as the last speaker had chosen, about uh, moving up from 24 to 23. Um, I also was at the previous meeting when that was discussed and talked about, and I'm kind of confused because. I mean, let's face it. I mean, I've been criticized for the last two years being mayor and the way my council affected things and not listening to staff, recommendations from staff, recommendations from Karen Kennard, uh, from Bob Sullivan, um, even from DPW when it would come to uh, Peter Rice. So at that meeting, Councillor Baggy, you had gone and asked a question and you were emphatically told not only by the city manager, but by Peter Rice, that there were two perspectives out of it, one being financial um, and at 1.6 million dollars I'm sure most people probably don't think that 1.6 million dollars means a whole lot to anybody just by going and paying over a bond over 20 years so you know it's it's cost effective um, Peter Rice basically said the same thing it was put in place for 24 for a reason and a purpose the other one was is you didn't have collaboration <clears throat> and I know that you and many others are new but collaboration is key in, to me in my heart and the perfect example is Pebbly Hill Beverly Hill has been trying to get sidewalks for the better part of over 20 years. And finally, last year, we did the approval. And that went on for years. The eight years that I embedded into the community itself to be able to go and fight for that. And last year, we had collaboration from 100%. I don't think we should be moving forward with anything unless you have 100% do a sidewalk. It worked out great. We did a couple of them, rode a bus. It worked out well. Uh, the mayor even complimented me on the simple fact that it came down to two, sorry, three residents that had concerns. And by the end of that bus ride, and when we made back into these chambers, those three residents came, was still with concerns, but it was full 100% collaboration. And that's what a council is supposed to do. 
you go and you collaborate. You're affecting 72 homes, literally by going and putting these sidewalks in. I have nothing against sidewalks. Actually, I am a graduate of Dondero. I never lived over in, in, in that area, but I played. I grew up in that neighborhood. We never had a problem or an issue. And I know that times have changed and there's more cars and there's more people that are there. But until we start to go and fix what we've got, do you know what the sidewalks look like over in Maple Haven? You know, you've got the assistant mayor that's there with these little teeny tiny strips and bumps and hurls and everything else. Anybody been in over in the Panaway lately? The trees and the roots and everything? Before we start more infrastructure, more overhead expenditures, my father and my grandfather both taught me, don't pay for a tool unless it's going to pay for itself. We have infrastructure issues and problems there that we have to go and maintain, ones that we can't even maintain and plow. I, the last time I ever saw, and I'm sorry, nothing against DPW, I love the guys that work for it, but I don't remember ever seeing one of those fancy uh, sidewalk uh, blowers or plows out in Maple Haven. I mean, they're hard to get along with where the, where the mayor's is now because of the infrastructure that's there. Before we create new, let's fix what we've got. That's the right thing to do. I, I, I wholeheartedly respect what you're talking about going and doing and, and being able to collaborate. I have nothing against what, uh, the, what the previous speaker had gone and said. I've devoted my life. Portsmouth gave me almost 40 years. I'm not going anywhere. But at least that history is what's important. History is what brought us together to this point now to brought me to where I am. The history has got to be taught. You got to listen to it, not repeat those same mistakes. It's the reason why we go and we teach it in our schools to our students. So please, before you go and do it, you, you've been told by two staff members, high end staff members that were not there yet, figure out a way to go and do it, do a site walk, you know, make a thing of it. It really is. People really get charged when, when you invite them out and it's God, they're wanting to talk to me. The mayor went and stood with me at at least two meetings over on Bartlett Street, and people thought it was gonna be contentious. It was great. People like that stuff, do that. Don't just go and vote on something and move it forward because you feel it's the right intent when you don't have the collaboration from the people that are gonna be affected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Good evening, everyone. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And I just ask for two things. One, I still would like to see money, more money in for the cemetery committee. They got a lot of stuff to do, and I would encourage you to add money to that online. The other thing is, I ask that as a new council, you really look at the bonding. When we uh, started investigating the bonding um, in the city, at one point, we had $113 million in different funds. I would ask that before you bond, you make sure your time frame. You make sure that we're not bonding just to get cash in the coffers for a AAA rating, but we're actually going to use the funds. So I ask that you take time and understand the bonding of everything you're agreeing to on that CIP. I know it'll take some work, and it might take some reaching out to others for education, but I would encourage you to look at that bonding and the way the city bonds. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Any other speakers here? Hi again, my name is Allison Tanner. I live at 380 Greenleaf Avenue in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I am also here to um, support the uh, funds for a climate action plan. Uh, it provides guidance that I think the city needs moving forward with this changing climate. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. All right, we have two hands on Zoom. Uh, Bert, could you please state your name and address? Can you hear me now? Loud and clear, Bert. Well, I'm impressed with this process. I've never been on this way before. I just would like to, uh, I took my hand down, I thought, but uh, both Allison and Effie and uh, Christine, who were talking about the Climate Action Plan, I'd like to support it because I think 
of the urgency and the time frame we're working in. The council is taking a forward-looking position, and uh, I hope to see how it progresses to get us to a climate-safe plan. Thanks a lot for your efforts. Thank you, Bert. Next, we have Robert Smith. Robert, could you please state your name and address again for the record? Robert Smith, 240 McKinley Road. I'd uh, just like to address the sidewalks again. Um, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Rich Brabazon and uh, Rick Bedstead and, and what they presented. Um, I've lived in Portsmouth a long time. Um, went to Dondero School in the 60s. The junior high, when it was a junior high, and graduated from Portsmouth High. I always walked to Dondero when I was living on Grant Avenue. Um, took the bus when I lived in Maple Haven. I live in Elwin Park again. Um, I just see the cost and expense of putting these sidewalks in uh, as there, there are other alternatives that, that we should be looking at. Uh, and I agree with um, what Mr. Beckstead said about getting 100% buy-in. Um, I think we need to talk to every resident on McKinley Road specifically and so they know exactly what's going in in front of their houses. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Let's see, no other speakers I would move. We uh, keep the public hearing open or I'd wait a motion to continue the public hearing into the next uh, meeting. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> All right, so that's that. Oh, just. Now we have um, third and final reading of ordinance amending chapter three, article 11, section 3.1101-3.1105, uh, face coverings during the COVID-19 pandemic. A sample motion moved that third reading uh, of the face covering ordinance be postponed and definitely not to be brought back before the city council without one meeting prior notice. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? Councilor Moreau. I'm just wondering, I guess, would it be easier and, and I'm just looking for background to actually just go ahead and pass it so that it would then, if the rates climbed again, spiked, would it be easier to move forward with with it versus us having to give notice a meeting and then have another meeting reading so that's a a, a question for the council or a question specifically for uh, i would think Aaron? possibly either the city manager or the city attorney sure. i think <clears throat> obviously that's a total policy decision for the council um if the council were to take either action i think we could proceed with it the assistant mayor, then Councilor Bagley, then Councilor Blaylock. Um, I think this would be a question for city attorney, city manager. Is it possible to put a provision in this that, that somehow mentions CDC guidelines, health department guidelines, as, they, as we know that this endemic pandemic is, is ever changing? And so my concern is that if we pass this motion and it has the 8% the number there and those guidelines, as those guidelines changes, as vaccination rates changes, as, as this um, pandemic morphs, that those could be antiquated um, measures. The answer to your question, I think, is that it is possible. Uh, however, I don't think it's possible right here and right now mm -hmm. because of the, I've always cautioned against trying to make complicated amendments to ordinances on the fly. Uh, it's just too difficult to get it all right and the uh, unforeseen consequences are rampant. So the answer is, it's, it, it's possible. I just want for the record, that was Chief Murner. <laughs> <laughs> it was a no. jam though, it was a jam. <laughs> I was trying to, I, it wasn't, it, it, okay, uh, Kelly corrected me. I was trying to blame it on Chief Murner. It was Chief Newport. <laughs> Sorry. Kelly pulled your card on that, Chief. I was trying to. 
<laughs> if I can jump in at this point to say that just as the public, um, as, just as a health officer felt strongly enough to issue, the, uh, to suggest that a public health directive be issued, uh, we could do that again. And then if this um, postponement were to pass, I think it would trigger a, 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 a revisit to the council in this form so that at the next meeting, um, with one prior notice, you could take that up. Okay. Uh, so I had Councillor Bagley, Councillor Bullock, then uh, Councillor Brody. Yeah, I guess I, my points kind of echo the assistant mayors. I, I think this is such a, as we've learned, uh, evolving situation that trying to guess what it's going to do next is probably not possible. So I think we, we move to table this or to postpone this, and we rely on the guidance of our health officer if the situation got such that we would need another ordinance, uh, which I'm sure we all hope we wouldn't. Thank you. Councillor Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I agree with what Assistant Mayor Kelly said and what uh, Councillor Bagley said. Um, I also want to make sure that we're not sending mixed messages. I know there's been a lot of information. There's been a lot of changing of information. That's the last thing I would want this council to do to the public. Um, so I think while the transmission rates are low, if we pass the mass mandate, it might send a mixed message. We can't write the headlines tomorrow. The last thing I would like to see is council passes a mask mandate. Thank you. Councilman Barty. Council Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I believe it's part of our rules that we can't make amendments to on a third uh, reading of a motion. Your Honor, I, amendment cannot be made a third reading unless there's a prior suspension of the rules. Okay. Which calls for a two thirds vote. Okay. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think the intention of the council working towards a mask mandate was always to support the public health officer and the health directive that was already issued. There is nothing um, in tabling this that would stop our health officer from issuing, issuing another directive when it was necessary. And then the council could move to act to support that directive again. Um, I personally don't believe that it's necessary that the council take any action to support um, directives issued by our health officer because I think those directives are things that we follow anyway as a community. That's part of the reason we have a public health officer so that we can respond quickly whenever we have a crisis. And our public health officer has done a great job in leading us in responding quickly. That's why we had a health directive when we needed the health directive. And I, get, I think we can count on her to do that again if it's necessary. And then the council can move to act and support her. With no other uh, comments, uh, I will simply uh, state that I, um, this is uh, by not passing this, certainly not a declaration of a victory over COVID-19. We're all still uh, very much uh, dealing with this, but it is a recognition that we are moving to a, another phase uh, of this, uh, learning to live with this. Um, I agree with the comments tonight that we uh, will likely not need to uh, pass this. Um, and instead, uh, if some reason in the future that we do not foresee right now, uh, need to have it back, we'll be in a better position to take the latest guidance on that and amend uh, that, that uh, uh, ordinance as necessary in the future. Uh, since we can't see that future now, uh, I would agree uh, in tabling this. Uh, and so we will do so uh, with a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Tabor? Yes. Councillor Denton? Yes. Councillor Moreau? Yes. Council Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? <clears throat> yes. Mayor McCachran? Yes. <clears throat> Unanimous. All right, next up is the uh, city manager's items which require action. And for those of you that might be surprised uh, tuning in at home, uh, we made a change in the agenda to bring the city manager actions up uh, 
forward uh, a couple reasons behind that one uh, staff is here for that uh, and they can likely get out of uh, here once we do that and then there's some stuff that always kind of gets lost to, to the end um, rest assured if there's an issue of, of, of grave importance that's under their counselor's name uh, we will suspend the rules and bring that forward um, but want to try it uh, this way so city manager thank you mr. mayor First up is a request for a public hearing regarding, le regarding the elderly and disabled exemptions. It's that time of year that annually the city reviews income and asset levels for both the elderly and disabled exemptions and then makes recommendations as to these levels pursuant to two RSAs listed. So our assessor, Roseanne Morris-Lentz, is here to answer any questions you may have. She provided a memo that's in your packet. It outlines three options for consideration. She will be making a full-blown presentation at the March 7th meeting where we'll have the public hearing and look for action on that measure. Um, but tonight's request is simply to, to set that public hearing and to formally have that conversation on March 7th. Any questions for Roseanne? You're on. Councilor Tabor. Um, we, uh, back in 2020, took a look at the amount of the exemption and had that kept, kept pace with the rise in property values. And um, we did an analysis going all the way back to 2006. The original intent was that the exemption be about half of the value of the home. So I was wondering, are we still at, uh, and then we adjusted the amount of the exemption significantly mm -hmm. to bring it up to the, the higher home values. Mm -hmm. um, so my request would, would be, um, could we check in on that again uh, when we talk about this? My suggestion would be, since I'm doing revaluation this year, is to wait to do that once I have some numbers from the revaluation okay. so you could see where the median single family assessment is going to fall. I didn't know how the time would be. Right. You can make the adjustment to the exemption amount any time before the MS1 is complete. It's, it's the qualification amounts that I need now before the April 15th date to allow people to qualify for the exemption. But the exemption amount can be changed at any time prior to me filing the valuation um, to the state of New Hampshire for our tax rate setting. Thank you. Councillor Cook. I have a question around care providers of the disabled. So when you have an individual who may hold more than $175,000 in assets but is not capable of working um, because they are a, a full-time care provider for somebody who is disabled and that person lives with them but does not own the asset, the house, mm -hmm. um, how do we address that? We don't. The statute only allows for the person owning the property to be able to qualify for the exemption. That's just that's statutorily driven. So I just have uh, one quick question, uh, Roseanne. On the, oh, I think it's quick. Maybe not. Um, the um, you've asked that we need to commit to uh, what would be the income uh, or the eligibility requirements, both on income for single, married, and then asset levels. Mm -hmm. When I've told people about this in the past that we've increased it, they've looked into it and they've said, well, that's, that's great, that's, that's nice, but it's, it's not gonna affect us because I have you know, maybe $175,000 or more in a, uh, in a uh, a 401k or something to that effect where it doesn't quite qualify uh, for them but they um, you know have a significant uh, tax responsibility is it something that you can bring forward in terms of uh, impact to budget if we were to look at increasing those income levels and then further increasing uh, the asset limit around that in terms of what our expected kind of net out from a tax perspective would be um, well Judy and I can look at what the impact would be is if you increased well that would be difficult because I wouldn't know how many more would qualify for that so I wouldn't know what that impact would be the only p impact I really can calculate is how much the exemption amount off the value of the property would impact the tax rate not the amount of people that would be able to qualify 
Okay. So that 175 is a, in it is a um, amount of an asset, and unfortunately, the New Hampshire state statute makes me look at every single bit of income that somebody has outside of Social Security. Yes, yeah, so including I, Social Security. So I mean, it's a it's tricky because 175,000. Um, you, you know, you have to live on that amount too uh, mm -hmm. if you're uh, not earning, um, you know, uh, en enough money, and so I think that's the that's the tricky part. Maybe um, I think certainly around revaluations, uh, getting that uh, understanding that the total amount that that could be uh, could be taken off. But I'd be, I guess, a final question would be: Are there any limits uh, to what the city of Portsmouth can do from a uh, a qualification standpoint? From there's only minimums, no limits. No limits. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Roseanne. You're Very much appreciated. Have a nice evening. So, Mr. Mayor, we would look for someone to move to schedule a public hearing. Oh yeah, yeah. At the next council meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thanks very much. Item number two is the outdoor dining and street cafe recommendation conversation. So, as you will recall. We have uh, put some recommendations to you, the council, and we were careful to include as many opinions and as many voices as we could. We held this memo until after the Chamber Collaborative of Greater Portsmouth held a conversation via Zoom. There were over 40 people on that call. And um, what, I have, what, we, what I have put before you is really the product of a team effort involving the fire department, the police department, DPW planning, legal inspections, parking, economic development, and health. And I, I'm afraid I left out, gosh, the clerk or, or the welfare director. But the, the, all this to say, this was a comprehensive effort. Uh, we were cognizant of the fact that the request came to report back on outdoor dining, but you really can't do that unless you take into account all the users of the public realm, uh, including retailers, other businesses, restaurants, residents, visitors, you name it. So I'll cut, to, uh, I'll cut to the recommendations and the proposed changes from last year. And we, are, we have broken this into different ways to consider this. There's uh, one provision for the use of city sidewalks and parking spaces. And uh, what we are willing, uh, what we would like to do is to roll this out with your blessing if there is support for outdoor dining as quickly as tomorrow. Uh, and you will see in the bullets here that there are many provisions that stayed the same from 2020 and 2021. We're only slightly updating the information that will be available through our online permitting system. Uh, the big changes this year, as have been discussed, is the proposal of fees. And for use of city sidewalks, we are considering uh, putting forth for your consideration $10 per square foot for the cafe areas, similar to what we did pre-COVID with a minimum of $2,000. And in consideration of parking spaces, uh, we, we really wanted to provide some point of reference. And in the case of parking spaces, those are currently monetized. And the value on an annualized basis based on usage uh, through a calculation that Parking Director Ben Fletcher is here to walk through if anyone cares to, um, is the number of $5,700. Now, we would implement whatever it is this council would like to do. We thought it was appropriate to put a number out there that represents the, the what happens when you use a parking space for something other than parking, quite frankly. Uh, the other change to this realm would be that um, we would be recommending a butter approval, that if the applicant proposes using spaces beyond their storefront and into the parking or the sidewalk area in front of their storefront, they must first provide a butter consent for the use of that space. The other realm is for use of city streets or the travel way. As you can imagine, travel ways were not built for any other use than than vehicular travel. So um, with, with specific note of police and fire, there is much more concern about use of the travel lanes for outdoor dining. And as such, there are proposed changes that speak specifically to traffic circulation and um, impacts to the way traffic moves through the downtown or specifically the resulting change to a directional pattern of a street, which is not something that we would feel comfortable with this year. The same um, consideration of fees and a butter approval are in this section as well. And specific to the use of the travel lane, the staff is proposing that 2022 be a transitional year 
and that 2023 really be a year where travel ways are not considered unless travel ways are really part of a larger revisioning of the way vehicles are allowed to circulate through the downtown. Because as you can imagine, that's a much bigger, broader ask, and we would want to be more thoughtful about that. So uh, we put all this to you for your consideration. We are here to answer any questions you may have. And then the last thing I would mention, as I hinted about, is that we would propose to stand this program up as early as tomorrow with similar time frames from last year where uh, the idea would be folks who are able to consider use of the public realm in the March time frame, which is uh, sidewalks and public realm, uh, certain areas would, could be early March. And then as we did last year, the barriers would be placed out in the streets the week of April 7th so as to get by the snow periods. Um, and as we did last year, we are proposing an end date of November 27th. Um, but certainly all of this is for your consideration. It's uh, Councillor Denton and Councillor Bagley and Councillor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Just to help me better understand the cost here, could you give some examples from last year if some of the restaurants use the same space, what they would be paying under these amounts? I can certainly do that. We could, we could, if you offered up a couple, a couple examples, we can certainly do that. For instance, popovers was seventy-five hundred dollars back in twenty nineteen. They were one of the five restaurants that was permitted pre-COVID in the public realm. <laughs> Rira was a little smaller than that, and again, it was purely based on square footage. So, if I may, my. Questions here, uh, Clipper Tavern, the owner was here. I was curious what that cost might be for comparative reasons. And then I'll pick some place with um, parking spaces. How about uh, the press room slash German bakery, whose name I would butcher, on Sol <laughs> area. Um, I would look for Peter Ben to tell me how many spaces the press room and Cafe Von Son took up, but um, I'll use Mark McNabb's ex uh, sure. example of the Rosa because sure. I know that took up three parking spaces. And um, using our suggested fee uh, of realizing the monetized value of a space, it would be 5,700 times three. 17,100. 100. 100. Thank you. Um, to, to be fair, we. I don't know the length of linear feet that the Clipper Tavern space took up. I'm, I'm trying to eyeball it, but um, that's a good example of when the only way to realize outdoor dining for that particular restaurant was to change the direction of a one-way street. That resulted in uh, numerous um, people going the wrong way, and that really presented a, a public safety concern. And I do know that um, Chief Newport's still here, and I know Fire Chief Germain is available as well. Thank you. Uh, I forgot my order, so Assistant <laughs> Mayor, and then. Oh, they can go first. That's okay. Councillor Bagley. <clears throat> um, I guess we're going to get a couple bites at the apple, so I'll start with a couple things. Um, I've got a series of questions. Maybe be best to get out of the way regarding parking. Um, do we know the occupancy of the two garages and what the occupancy at the height of the summer was this past year? We do, uh, Mayor, through you. Uh, Hanover generally peaks at lunch and dinner times, and for FY22 so far, and this may not answer your question in peak of season 21 yet, Hanover is averaging 72% during the lunch hour and 59% during the, the dinner crowd. And it's important to note that in anticipation of the Hanover renovation project, we have sought to actively reduce the monthly card holders at, Han at Hanover by 300 through pricing and attrition so that when we close at the garage a third at a time, we will, we'll, we will be honoring the, the pass holders that are there. Um, it, may be, it may be best for Ben to come on here. Yeah. That, that would really, sure. if it's okay with you, Mr. Mayor. But um, he can speak to it way better than I can. I've got all the Ben information here, and, I, and he doesn't. Is Ben on that. Zoom? He is. Great. <clears throat> Over to you, Ben. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. <clears throat> we can't see you, though. We step. expect you to wear a collared shirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that PTS uh, or that uh, parking shirt there, as you would often do, but we'll just have to imagine it. Uh, I suppose I could put the video on. <laughs> so, uh, city manager was doing a file. I don't actually see the ability to put a video on, but that's fine. 
So the city manager is doing a fine job of explaining this. Actually, um, with that 300 users, if if uh, if you consider what's called a 43% a, a what's called a diversity rate, that's how many folks are not using the garage that are a card holder at any specific time. It's a very high diversity rate, so we, we enjoy the ability to uh, sell the garage to three different users, one being uh, morning users, one evening users, and then of course transient parking. With a 43% diversity rate, that means 57% of those 300 parkers we uh, uh, took out of that garage by attrition and by uh, pricing over to Hanover, or excuse me, to Foundry, that means 171 users are permanently removed from the equation, a figure that equates to about 19, 18 and a half to 19 percent of the garage's capacity. This is why in 2019, pre-pandemic, Hanover averaged about 18 percent higher for both of these time slots, which puts the garage essentially at full, particularly at the lunchtime hour. So that gives you some uh, some context as to why 72 percent at this point and 59 percent may not sound so high, but uh, we can consider um, a great possibility that we're going to be returning to uh, the, the same types of figures we saw in 2019 uh, rather shortly. Uh, it's our belief that the garage is going to routinely reach capacity when it is reduced to 600 spaces during renovation. Uh, Foundry has a distinctly different clientele, averaging over uh, eight hours per stay. Uh, it's mainly workforce parking, so this facility peaks uh, at 41 percent almost daily and runs that way throughout the day. So this garage also will, reteach, uh, will, will reach uh, capacity when Hanover is reduced. Those 300 parkers are going to uh, head straight to Foundry, uh, largely in our direction, but uh, you know, they're also going to find their way there as well by virtue of not having uh, on-street space. So that, uh, hopefully that answers your questions as to the capacities of the facilities as they stand today and where they should be uh, expected to go shortly. Yes, thank you. And Your Honor, I've got a few more questions for the parking director, if I may. Um, the employee parking permits at the uh, Foundry Garage, uh, approximately how many of those are we issuing each month? The average uh, six-month average thus far this year is 1,694 single-use permits issued each month at $3 a piece, average of uh, $5,082 in sales. So, yeah, it's important to understand that this is a a very uh, transient group. Uh, you're not going to see the same number of users of this type of pass on a Tuesday afternoon that you will see on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday evening uh, because the program is aimed at, at uh, users that are specific to uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the service industry within the hotel and, uh, and bar and restaurant industry. So the, the times that those, uh, those groups are having their highest levels of traffic are when you can expect to see uh, this group um, use uh, the parking at the Foundry facility. It, it's still unique that the Foundry has an eight hour plus length of stay. We've had great success uh, with this program and with other initiatives to try and move a lot of our workforce parking in that direction uh, so that uh, we can um, uh, better absorb uh, the ramifications of the necessary ongoing project, uh, upcoming project, I should say, uh, for the Hanover renovation. Great, thank you. And uh, how many spaces did we add at the McIntyre site to our downtown inventory? So there's a total of 86 spaces at the McIntyre, 37 on the lower hour uh, area accessed at the intersection of Bow and Penn Hollow Series, and 49 in the upper area accessed directly across from the River House. It's actually two separate lots there. Um, it's it's probably important to note that the city does not. Uh, recognized revenue generated in this lot uh, because it has to do with um, our relationship with uh, the, the um, federal government and the building itself. So uh, while it does require, it does uh, uh, give us some reprieve from uh, space issues, it does not represent uh, revenue gained on the city's behalf in the term of pure parking revenues. Great, thank you. And um, the annual revenue, I believe we have $150 permit cost for loading zones that is due annually. The annual revenue generated from those loading zone permits, do we have a number on that? So yeah, the loading zone permits right now, actually that number was, was uh, uh, where did I put this one, hang on guys. Ben was kind enough to give it to me earlier today. That number is currently seven. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we have seven. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Manager Connor, go ahead. No, I'm just using your words. So, uh, those so are yeah. <laughs> 
So currently, uh, there's seven permits issued at $250. That's $1,750 in total collections for the current year. So this is a program, just to give some context, that saw problematic abuse in the past. We intentionally increased the price on annual loading zone permits, effective 1-1-22, to $250 from the 7-1-21 budget approval for FY22 in order to discourage the very common practice of buying these passes just for the luxury of having multiple 30-minute free parking spaces around town. So uh, the idea was to uh, to offer this program to businesses that were in, in need of such services and uh, to clear the space for professional loading and unloading and, uh, and eliminate uh, citizen uh, use of said spaces in lieu of uh, uh, having them use regular parking solutions. And, and my final question for, for right now is, um, even though I realize this is not something we would do, if we were to turn those loading zone areas into revenue generating parking spaces, do we have a rough number on what that might generate? So, you know, I did put something together for that. It's, it's, it's difficult really because the, the behavior patterns are, are largely unpredictable, particularly since it's a new uh, source of parking. Uh, uh, we, we talked about, I think, 39 spaces total when we were looking at uh, you know, the discussion on repurposing some of these spaces, not all of the loading zone spaces uh, in, in our meetings at PTS uh, at 11, 16, 21, that'll, that, uh, the minutes of which will come forward here, I believe, in our next uh, city council meeting. So 39 spaces with the percentage of those being in... Um, a vast percentage of those being an A zone and a smaller percentage being a B zone. If, if memory serves, uh, the, the, the pure gain, if, 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 uh, if demand were to hold true across the board, the pure gain in spaces at 100% demand would be about $120,000, $125,000. But you'd have to recognize that some of that parking would probably, in, in light of uh, less than 100 or 100 plus demand, uh, which I think is going to be alleviated uh, shortly, but uh, in our current situation, some of that parking would come from the garages. So you'd have to recognize that there would be some lost revenue in those situations. Uh, and so that, that number is probably fluid, but I think it's fair enough to, to use those figures. Great, thank you. That, that's the questions I, I have for the parking director. And I just wanna say, I appreciate you getting all that rather complex information together for us for tonight. My pleasure, Council. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just am curious how many um, restaurants or cafes are directly impacted by this, the provision not allowing reversal of a travel way? That's a good question. Um, I think it's a function of who might reapply this year. Um, I will offer up Clipper Tavern is one. I would offer up that uh, the Franklin is one on Fleet Street. Uh, there aren't that many where this was a concern in terms of circulation. I, I think it's fair to say that the, that the three that take up space on Congress were not um, certainly reversing, you know, uh, one way in the wrong direction, but taking up a travel lane is a consideration. Assistant Mayor. Thank you. Um, this would be more of a question to, for um, uh, Peter Rice and, and Chief Newport. Um, so it, th there's been some concern about um, some of these restaurants really are only utilized at night. Um, and I know that, um, you know, it, it's been discussed, you know, the barriers, the Jersey barriers that, that are wanted for safety and, and concern. Have we looked into alternatives that could potentially, much like I, I referenced Mossimo, um, at night, you know, his, his station went out, during the day it came in. Are we looking at potential alternatives? So there, there's some places that, you know, we wouldn't lose those spots during the day if they weren't, if the restaurant didn't want to utilize those spaces. I think while Peter's coming down, yes. if I can take a stab at that, yes. Mayor, through uh, to the Assistant Mayor, there, there are, every situation is different and the use of the barriers is key when it's needed to protect um, travel. And some areas are able to be protected when you just place the Jersey barrier at a leading edge and uh, Penhello is a good example of that. Um, but Peter and Mark are here now, so I will stop. 
Yeah, so I'm not 100% clear what your question was. It was whether there, we were looking at spaces, whether we identified spaces, or were there instances where it could be allowed? I guess, I guess it's a joint question, both, both of those. Have, could we consider alternatives so that we wouldn't lose spaces that aren't being utilized during the day by restaurants? Um, and yes, then the second part is, are there spaces that you could consider? So you were asking basically if there's portable barriers that could be yes. in and out. That's a much simpler way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the short answer would be no, that could be conveniently moved in and out, at least not by uh, DPW staff. That would suffice for stopping the vehicle that I think would be safe, especially at night, uh, without having the proper equipment, which um, wouldn't be accessible on a daily basis. And I wouldn't consider this to be a DPW job. I would consider this to be, and I use Mossable as an example, it, it would be the restaurant's job to, to figure out some type of, if you know, there was an approved barrier that could be moved or such. And in Mossable's case, it's, it's a pretty unique site in that it's a, it's a very low speed uh, street and there was a lot of congestion in front of it uh, really helping to calm tra traffic down. It's also a one way street. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, in concept, yes, there are probably opportunities similar, uh, but there's nothing at this point that, you know, that we would contemplate. I mean, somebody would have to come forward with the recommendation, and as, as the chief said, it's really about safety. Um, you know, if it's at all potential, um, you know, for, for cars coming into it accidentally, we'd want to make sure at least the, a minimum the leading edge would have a, a solid barrier. Um, Absolutely. But it would have to be seen as you know, would have to it'd be a case by case situation. Okay. Um, another question is, I, I know that we don't have a tra traffic engineer right now, but is it is it possible that we can, or have we in the, in the recent years, <laughs> done a traffic study to, to potentially change the flow of some of the streets? Um, I know there's the conversation back and forth of close, close uh, Market Square, don't close Market Square. I fully understand. Uh, the fire chiefs, DPW, and the police chiefs standpoint on it, and I actually support that. My question is, um, you know, as we, as we, and I, I kind of look back at the, the event we had at the chamber where we talk about, you know, downtown wasn't made for, you know, potentially outdoor dining, and then the argument that downtown wasn't designed for vehicles either, and especially, I would say, the amount of vehicles that we've seen over the last decade to two decades of growth of tourism in Portsmouth. So my question is, is there, a way or a study that we could potentially um, look into at, at what the impact of removing some of the vehicles downtown to allow not just outdoor dining, but outdoor shed space for, re for real um, realtors, for retail and other things. Absolutely, there's, there's, um, there's traffic simulation models that you can, you can go through and you can modify the configuration of the roadway and show through modeling you know, how, how that impacts traffic and, and whether it works or not. Um, we, you know, we are um, hopefully going to be uh, uh, having a, uh, a parking engineer uh, starting Monday. Um, he, he's uh, very familiar to you. Yeah. Uh, Eric Eby will be coming back. Eric Eby is hey. indeed hey. oh. That's news we've heard all night. <laughs> yeah. Um, very excited. Yeah. Um, and then um, I did have one more question, and I don't know it right now, so maybe I'll loop back. I just had one quick follow-up to one of the assistant mayor questions while you're up here. Uh, retractable kind of reinforced bollards that uh, I remember on university campuses. Um, could we look into those in terms of, uh, or you see them outside of embassies um, that can lower, obviously, um, and then raise uh, the ease of doing that, whether it's electronic, tends to up the price. But I've seen ones that have just kind of in the ground and then they, they come up and they walk. Is that something that we could seriously investigate? Certainly not uh, potentially for, for this year, but in years future, if we would want to close down sections or you know potentially allow dining in areas around traffic stops that or, or parking spaces that would have a, um, a, a more, I guess, temporary uh, portfolio than a moving in a Jersey barrier. Yeah, I could. I, yes, there's definitely items like that that are available. It's just a matter of, you know, the invest in the cost and what optimally the city or the council decides they would want to do. But where there's a will, there's a way. He can do it. It's just a matter of how much is it going to cost and you know, how right. long will it take to do it. And I, and I would um, add to that that 
it, you'd really need to have it in the context of a larger plan. Yep. Because the, the investment in that type of uh, infrastructure sure. really, yeah. it's not a temporary thing. It's, you know, it's something that, that you know, you're going to change the configuration of the roadway. You're going to change the uh, operation of the roadway for larger periods of time. So make it worthwhile and it become a permanent type of activity. So I, I, it's definitely something that can be looked at um, in the context of a larger uh, adjustment. Okay, uh, you know, and I'd like that, you know, whether it's through PTS or, um, or just a report back to understand uh, all, uh, I guess, um, I don't even know what the term would be, you know, traffic mitigation measures, you know, for pedestrian uh, uh, use of, of public uh, thoroughfares, but uh, all, uh, uh, you know, possible, uh, I guess, mitigation efforts that the city could take under and then, you know, as a part of a broader plan, uh, where that could go. Uh, because I know that uh, we're not going to as much as, you know, we've moved past cars, we still get deliveries, we still have a need for all of those things. So permanently shutting those things down, likely uh, harder to do, but if they could be uh, temporarily shut down, that might be a uh, or reversibly shut down. Uh, just to add to that, uh, Chief Jermaine's not here in person, but I think it'll be more of an issue for the fire department in getting their vehicles through more so than the police department. Um, he is on Zoom, I believe him. All right, and just because he's not here in person doesn't mean that we don't <laughs> care what he has right. to say. But why, we won't, I won't sidetrack the conversation. <laughs> Sister Mayor, did you remember the last <laughs> okay. I I did. So as you discussed, looking at the broader and bigger and bigger, bigger picture, and uh, I'd be remiss to say that we we received a lot of support from from residents, um, not just business owners. I would say the majority of emails we got were from residents that were in support of. Um, I know we always call it on uh, outdoor dining, but I like to refer to it as on street dining because that's really the issue here is the is taking up the the street ways. Um, and so I I have a quick question and I think we've touched on it before but I just want to reconfirm it in in the public realm um, Fleet Street with the with the renovations of Fleet Street and the the consensus if I'm if I'm correct was that the majority of residents that responded to the QR code were in favor of widening the sidewalks correct um, that's correct we I haven't digested all the numbers yet and we'll be you know presenting them at some point in the future but it is my understanding um, just by a rough look at the numbers that it was a, a, a pretty significant support for that so I think it's something that this is just a comment on a question that we should really take into account when we look over um, the master plan and the in the renovations that are going to be coming up to Market Square and and just that area in general that maybe alleviating some of this need um, of of on street dining would be to consider widening the sidewalks and and potentially even I know I uh, look at Market Square um, maybe even in some of those more congested streets removing one side of parking. Um, so therefore, we can widen the the sidewalk. So so again, um, my whole spiel is always making it more pedestrian friendly downtown. As someone who who works downtown and sits out, um, Mr. Rice, you would know. You'd hear me yell at people speeding all the time on on Market Street. So that's that's a, that's a concern with outdoor dining or without outdoor dining. So trying to figure out some more more aggressive calming measures over the next few years. We're calming aggressive measures. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Bagley, then back to Councillor Cook. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, Councillor Tabor hasn't asked anything yet, so first by the apple, and then Councillor Moreau. Okay. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Um, I, I think we're kind of glossing over one of the big aspects of this. Um, you know, we're a policy setting board, and what I read in the city manager's memo was street dining is not just beneficial to restaurants. It's something that benefits the whole community. It really makes the downtown vibrant, and it's created a great atmosphere. And so I think the first thing for us to think about is, don't we want to keep going down the direction, that direction, and make it permanent? Okay, if we're going to go that direction as a city, then how do we make it work in the interim next year and then longer-term solutions? Um, I think Councillor Bagley's questions really have uh, surfaced the fact that if we took parking away for street dining, there's still plenty of capacity in the garages, uh, which is great um, and bolsters the case. Um, I do hear 
from the restaurants that have given us feedback and others I've talked to that the $5,700 for a parking space doesn't quite pencil out. Um, you know, if you have four to six tables and three parking spaces, you have to generate more than $120,000 of revenue, maybe as much as $300,000 in, in five months. So that's a tough equation. Um, if we could come in a little lower uh, in the sidewalk charge, I think it would um, foster the kind of um, street dining atmosphere that we want to build. Um, and also we've heard that uh, the $2,000 minimum for sidewalk space um, exists for just a few larger restaurants like uh, popovers. But a lot of the smaller cafes have put street, have put chairs out and uh, they weren't paying that. So that would be prohibitive. So those are two of the inputs that, that seem to um, bubble up from the process we've had. And, um, but I think overall, and I agree with the assistant mayor, um, this adds a lot to our town. We want to make it work for the long haul. And now we're just working out the best way to do that. Thanks. Councilor Moreau. Um, I, I applaud the um, information that was put <coughs> together. And I do believe the city manager mentioned that there might be some justification for the $5,700 per parking spot or how they came yep. to that specific figure. Uh, mostly just because maybe as in Councilor Tabor was talking, we could do a sort of step up phase um, over a course of years versus doing maybe all in the first year. Because I really truly feel like if you can't park downtown, you're going to find someplace else. And maybe we really need to look at a broader spectrum of high occupancy streets be a shorter time period to cause more turnover. That way, people who are just trying to stop to do a, you know, a little bit of shopping on Market Street might find a parking spot if someone's not parked there for three or four hours or whatever the limit is. So I know that was like multiple questions at once, but I'll put it all out there. To the mayor and um, Ben, if you could unmute and catch anything I don't add, um, the, the way that we place that value on, the, on a per space annual collection figure, it was calculated for each street where spaces were repurposed and then we adjusted for the fact that seating would be in effect from April to October only, so for the period of time they were taken offline. Um, but also during those months, those on-street spaces see a much higher utilization or a transaction rate, which uh, of, according to Ben is somewhere in the 40%, 43% range. And that's how we came to the annualized valuation of one space for that period of time of $5,735, which we rounded down for easier math to 5,700. But um, I, I guess it, we're, we're not, we're, we're just the implementers, and, and we don't want to weigh in on, on what we think is appropriate. We just know that um, it's something that's currently monetized and collected, and, the, and as you know, the parking funds are utilized in a variety of ways. Um, it gives back in, to the tune of $2.4 million to the general fund. So if we were to impact what parking is able to produce in revenue, it has um, ripple effects. So it's not, um, it's not a decision in a vacuum is really what I just want to make sure people understood. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bagley, then Councillor Cook. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I'm going to be probably a bit long-winded, but I, I suppose at some point we probably should start making motions as well. Um, the the big concern I have, and, and you know, the response we got primarily from residents, but also from uh, restaurants, shops, retail tended to be split, whether they liked it or not. I would say more said that they didn't like it than did, uh, but there was a split there. But the, the overall sentiment is that it brought a vibrancy to downtown. It was kind of the silver lining, if there was one, of COVID was, was this outdoor dining. So I think what we all heard was that we want this to continue. Um, what we're hearing from restaurants is that at this price point, it probably won't continue or it'll, it'll continue as it did in the past where maybe we have a popover, or, well, not a re rock they're not there anymore, but you know, just a couple customers partaking in it, or a couple of restaurants, which I don't think is what the community wants. So I did some research this week, uh, New York City, uh, Boulder, Colorado, spent some time on the phone with people up in Burlington, Vermont, and they all are dealing with the same thing that we're dealing with. 
and, and I asked them, you know, what are you doing for fee structures? How are you recovering your losses? Um, the $5,700 number actually makes a lot of sense based on my phone calls. It seems five to 6,000 was the number that came up a lot for what people were valuing parking spaces at. Uh, I did get a pretty nice document from Burlington, Vermont. What they're doing, it's kind of convoluted math, but for no meter sidewalk spaces, they're doing $113. Uh, for the dollar an hour spaces, they're doing something like $300 per space. And then for what they call smart meters, which are slightly cheaper than the parking here in Portsmouth, somewhere between $1,000 and $3,000 per space. So um, at, at when we come down to make a motion, I think we have to realize that if we want to recoup the $5,700, we are going to have very few people participating in the program. Um, however, we did waive the fees the past two years, um, so we should be cognizant of that. On the other hand, I'm sitting here wearing a mask, so we're not completely out of COVID. You know, we're still in a challenging time. So I would propose that we come up with a fee that we think is equitable, and I would propose, um, I think Councillor Barreau had an excellent suggestion that maybe we stagger it in. You know, so maybe this year it's 25% of what it's ultimately going to be or 50% of what it's ultimately going to be. And then next year it would be 100%, but that would also give us an evaluation period. If we charge a fee and we get 12 restaurants that participate, maybe we're charging too high a fee. If we charge a fee and every restaurant participates, well, we know we can increase it without attrition. So I guess that's kind of food for thought to put out there that we should be looking to what other cities and towns are doing because they're in the same situation we are. We should be cognizant that the vast majority of the city wants the outdoor dining to continue and the vibrancy of it to continue. And then the final thing I'll add before I pass the floor to someone else is that 2022 is going to be the transition year by all accounts. We're going to decide something tonight, hopefully, that will be in place for this year. And then we're going to probably tell some restaurants until we bump out the sidewalks, you're not going to get to have this again. You, you, this is kind of your swan song for a year. And, and the place I would push back the most and I understand the safety concerns is I think if, if we're going to do that, we should do that for all the restaurants that had outdoor dining last year. If they want to have it this year, we should give them the opportunity to. And one consideration we might make is for those that cause the most issues with traffic flow, perhaps we could do an abbreviated season of June through Labor Day. And the other thing I would propose is the season, I think the start point is good. Um, the Halloween parade is, is, as we all know, quite a big event. Continuing outdoor dining past the Halloween date in my opinion, maybe doesn't make the most sense. So I'm looking at maybe October 15th or, um, you know, the second weekend after Indigenous Peoples Day or something along those lines as a better cutoff so that we clear the streets in time for the Halloween parade. And then we could make exceptions on a case by case basis, uh, especially for those places that have small bistro tables on the sidewalk that are easily cleared. So that's a, a whole lot that I wanted to get out there. I'll, I'll yield the floor to somebody else, but I just wanted to let everybody know I've done a, a lot of research on this and I think we should really look to what everybody, whatever other cities are doing to guide us because we don't need to make these decisions uh, in a vacuum. Thank you, Your Honor. Councilor Cook. Um, I still had another question that I think is for um, the city manager or for Peter Rice. Sure. Um, it's around uh, construction this summer downtown and what restaurants will be directly impacted who had outdoor dining last year will be directly impacted by any construction being done i think it's important to point out that and peter feel free to come on down and help me out um, i think it's important to point out that in april at some point the hanover garage renovation uh, the first year of three years which will be a third of the garage at the time will have a noise and um, as much as we can mitigate a dust factor and the hours of operation of that will be 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. through the week. Okay. Uh, weekend work is not permitted, so I think that's going to help inform the decision that restaurants immediately adjacent to the Hanover Garage may, may choose to take. Um, I, it's my understanding that the Brick Market Building is hoping to get a certificate of occupancy in early June. So um, the impacts in that immediate area will lessen. Peter, do you uh, know of any other construction issues in the area besides those two.
No, I, I'm, I, I wasn't prepared for this question. So I mean, there's a lot of construction that occurs, and it, it can be sporadic. Um, in that, you know, utility companies could come in, or, or contractors could be doing work and things like that. But I can't think of, um, I mean, big projects coming down the pike. Or, you know, Fleet Street is going to be not this year. Um, you know, that we'll be looking at Bridge Street, Bridge Street parking lot. But that's going to be relatively small duration. Um, Some exciting projects that won't impact traffic, like yeah, the one we're going to talk yeah, about I mean, next. Yeah, I mean, the Islington um, on the other end uh, will be continuing. Um, we won't, I don't believe we'll be in construction on uh, Maplewood Ave, but that's not near any dining. Um, yeah, I'm not, I can't think of anything really big, but if I do, I'll, I'll report back to the city manager and she can forward that information to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, you can I ask a follow on too? Um, can we develop uh, an, a plan for the restaurants or cafes that are impacted um, by road construction or um, differing traffic direction so that they have an alternative option? I would hate for anyone to be left out this year who had um, this opportunity in the past. Um, because of changes in either our provisions or because of uh, new construction that we're initiating? That's hard to answer it because, as, as pointed out, I tried to be diplomatic, but at the end of the day, not everyone will be treated equal here. There will be people who, who are advantaged by their property location, and there are folks that will be disadvantaged by their property location. Mm -hmm. And um, staff and I were having a, a candid conversation about this that um, and I don't mean this to sound as smug as it sounds, but I'll say it anyway, that if, if you were a business that came to rely so heavily on the ability to, to serve um, outside and in space that was, did not belong to your property, perhaps that's, that's a, an opportunity for that business to look at a different location or a different model. Um, because um, you know, there, there was a, a way for us to provide for folks when capacities were reduced during uh, the emergency um, situation but that has lessened so um, all that to say I don't know how to adequately answer your question because there aren't equitable solutions okay. there are there are some locations for, for which it is really problematic for the city to provide um, proximate dining I guess is the best way I can say that Peter or Beverly do you want to add anything to that uh, it, it's it's really a case-by-case -case situation there might be opportunities to mitigate the impacts uh, but oftentimes there are you know construction limits uh, what you can and can't do in an area so uh, I would hate to to force you know say that we yes we could absolutely accommodate folks you know we always try to mitigate impacts uh, as part of our contract uh, construction projects I mean we our job is to is to support the businesses um, and, and the residents in town it's not to make their lives miserable um, so we do the best we can, but construction is disruptive, uh, and it is inconvenient. Um, however, at the end of the day, uh, we're investing in infrastructure for the city that can contribute to the long-term, you know, viabil viability of the city. So, thank you. Um, and I guess my final my final question is that um, I noticed several requests for 15-minute um, temporary parking spots, and that's not officially included in this plan because it isn't actually outdoor dining um, but is there a plan to include um, additional 15 minute parking spots um, as was included last year in the plan? Uh, what we did in 2020 when several restaurants were highly and completely dependent on takeout is that we created a host of a, more, a, a dozen or more temporary 15 minute parking spaces mm -hmm. uh, we reverted back to the regular 15 minute parking spaces that currently exist downtown in 2021 as we have mentioned, perhaps not to this council, but to the prior council, those are hugely problematic to enforce. They essentially go um, unmonetized. And um, that being said, we wouldn't recommend the additional, any additional 15 minute spots. However, um, they were widely seen as helpful to the restaurants that came up in the conversation with the chamber. And I would venture to say they, they would be supported by retailers. What we did do in 2020 when they were temporary, we tried to locate them uh, in between multiple users so they could all benefit from them. Um, but that being said, it is not a current recommendation, but it's more an observation of what we've seen. So, so currently, um, businesses can re request through the Parking Traffic and Safety Committee 
uh, to locate a 15 minute parking space. So it, it's, it's, it is something that folks can request, but there's a process to go through. Um, I would suggest that we specifically look at 15 minute parking spaces, especially for retailers. We're saying that they're um, negatively impacted by outdoor dining because of people not being able to park and run in to pick up an item that they've either ordered or to drop up an item, that we should take that into special consideration um, by extending outdoor dining that we we listen to those retailers and their concerns around uh, pick up and drop off. Councilor Blaylock. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to thank city manager, public, uh, part of the public works, the police department, fire department, everyone for working on this. Um, we have an amazing town, Portsmouth, and one of the greatest things is our restaurants. Um, our downtown is very unique. We're very lucky. This pandemic was not ideal for restaurants, um, especially indoor dining. So we adapted and I want to thank everyone for making all that effort. And I know it's not easy. I know I've talked to the fire department, you know, they had to make adjustments. Um, the police department had to make adjustments, but I want to thank everyone for all their efforts. Um, I run a, I've run a restaurant, you know, I've worked the downtown since I was 12. I know all the different factors that go in. You got to bring out the trash. You got to bring in all the deliveries. You get the loading zones, you get the parking for the customers, you get parking for employees. There's so many factors to consider. And it's this situation, it's very hard to treat each location, each restaurant, each shop the same because each one is different. Each one is located at a different location. Each one, you know, has a sidewalk, might not have a sidewalk, might have a street, might not have a street. Um, like my restaurant doesn't have a street or a sidewalk. Um, <laughs> But we want to do our best to accommodate everyone. And I think it is important that we accommodate them financially as much as we can. Um, I think most restaurants are either still recovering or have closed from the pandemic. I want to I hope everyone understands that the perspective from a restaurant owner, you're still not out of it. You're still trying, you're, I mean, you always adjust your business plan, your model uh, to make it more successful. Um, but we're really trying to recover from what we've just been through. Um, and I understand, you know, imposing a fee on space on the um, sidewalk or parking spot. Um, you know, but there's no seat at the restaurant to sit, then there's no reason to go park downtown. Um, you know, so I think we need to favor that. And, and um, but I think we need to be careful on and stuff, imposing them on uh, businesses that have already suffered. Uh, the assistant mayor. And then uh, thank you. Uh, I, would, I would pose, I guess, a request to the city manager and the Park and Traffic and Safety Committee to look at those 15 minute spots and utilization and maybe even increase that time for, for to 30 minutes with the beneficiary really being retailers that people can pop into the store. I, I tend to think 15 minutes is not um, essentially enough time to pop into any business. And um, so I think that that would just be my request. I also would potentially put it on the floor for discussion that um, whatever fee we we may can come up with, um, potentially looking at a satellite program to allow retailers to do the, to occupy a space the same as we potentially are going to let a restaurant tour. So that was just a statement. Uh, Councilor Be or uh, Councilor Lombardi, yeah, you're up um, first. A while back, John Tabor, Councillor Tabor, um, was talking about Portsmouth not being built for all the cars that we have, um, and I, you know, I think that's true. I think part of the problem is the number of cars that come into Portsmouth that are requiring parking spaces. Um, it brings back to me the need for some other form of transportation uh you know within the city transportation that um can bring people to the center of town um from the outer regions of it uh we we had a a test of that um a couple of years ago with the church parking lot um i don't know how successful that was um, it seemed like people used it. It was free parking and a free bus. Um, but it seems to me as this is not a solution maybe for this year, but as time goes on, 
if we want to mitigate the need for so much parking in downtown, I think we have to look at a more universal public transportation system for Portsmouth. Just a comment. Councilor Bagley. I think I'm ready to make a motion. Um, I move and I'm, I'm going to make a motion with stipulations and I'm probably going to get some of this wrong so I'll look to guidance. Um, but I move we adopt the city's recommendations with the following stipulations. That fees be set at $1,500 per parking space implemented at a 50% rate for this year. That um, all businesses that operated with outdoor dining in 2020 and 2021 be given the opportunity, um, namely that businesses that had the worst effect on traffic be operating from the months of June 1st through Labor Day weekend. That outdoor dining shall operate um, in the spring as suggested, but shall end uh, October 15th or some date in that range uh, before the Halloween parade um, takes place. So I don't know exactly where the weekend falls, maybe it's the 17th or the 20th, but with enough time that DPW can have the streets clear in time for the parade. Um, and I guess I would say I agree that this is going to be the final year for a number of restaurants. Um, we're gonna try to do a, a better hashed out plan in 2023 when we have a bit more time to work on it. But I wanna kind of give that warning to all restaurants out there that this has the potential to be your final year uh, for outdoor dining. Um, just just kind of letting everybody know that what we come up with in 2023 may be material different from what we have for 2022. And I would mention that many of the cities I talked to, that's the approach they're taking. 2022 is kind of the year for everybody to do things as they've been doing it. And in 2023, we're not going to grandfather things in. We're going to start fresh from the ground up. Yeah, I'll second the initial motion that was made. Okay, uh, to, just to clarify the motion, it's, uh, the, it's, it's $750 per parking space this year? This year, that's correct. Okay, and then it stops, it was before uh, October 15th? Yes. I looked on the calendar, Mayor, uh, the weekend after Indigenous Peoples Day would, would put outdoor dining through Sunday, October 16th. Are you trying to get through that Sunday? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, okay. change it to 16th. Um, and then the last one was uh, to, uh, to uh, over or disregard the, uh, the, uh, uh, the recommendation of staff around uh, public safety around uh, uh, street closures. Yeah, and, and in particular, the Clipper Tavern and the Franklin House would be the ones most affected by my understanding of the okay. mm -hmm. uh councillor denton and then councillor moreau Councilor Tizen. and a friendly hopefully friendly amendment i'd like to make regards to the square footage because only the parking space size cost was reduced i think by a sixth if i did my math mm -hmm. correctly so the friendly amendment will be that the square footage for outdoor dining would be $2 per square foot. And then the minimum, which previously was $2,000, would be $600. So that. I accept that amendment friendly. Councilor Moreau. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not totally on board with dropping the fee quite so drastically. I think 5,700 to 1,500 and then you're dropping it another 50% seems a little way more than I'm probably on board for. Um, I'd be okay with dropping it 50% of where we're at now, <laughs> like for net, for this year. But I, yeah, so I, I, I just think it's way too low. I think it's, it's it needs to have at least a little bit of an impact to help offset 
what we might lose if especially with the parking garage being cut back so um that that would be my concern is is to I, I am all on board with lowering I'm just not quite maybe as much as has been proposed. Uh, Councillor Cook and then Councillor Tabor. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Oh. I have a point of clarification and then a comment after that. Uh, the first on the October 15th date, is that for all outdoor dining or just outdoor dining in the travel way or in parking spaces? Thank you, that in the travel way in the parking space. So basically, I guess the best way to say it is where the Jersey barriers are in the street. Okay. And my comment is this. Um, to me, outdoor dining is a real asset for Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. um, I am one of those individuals who hasn't gone out to eat in an indoor setting in Portsmouth since the onset of COVID-19. Um, because I am married to a healthcare professional, we already take on quite a bit of risk, and I'm high risk for COVID-19. And so we've been extremely cautious. And uh, I think a lot of our residents are in a similar place. In fact, we heard from a lot of residents who still feel the same way. We're not through the pandemic yet. I personally believe that we should continue outdoor dining in the same manner that we did last year without any additional fees. I realize that this is a transitional year and that's the way we're thinking about it, but I also believe that we're really late in the year and we're impacting plans for summer for many restaurants that were already doing their planning based upon the provisions last year. To me, it seems extremely late to be changing the rules for them. Um, I would support, in that sense, I'd support nominal fees this year, but I think next year really is the transitional year because I don't think we're out of the pandemic yet. Uh, first up is Councillor Tabor and then Councillor Lombardi. Uh, maybe it's because I sit on the fee committee and that makes me a bit of a revenue hawk, but I, uh, <laughs> I also agree with, Councillor Moreau, uh, that to go from 5,700 down to 750 is a big plunge. You know, we learned a lot in how we manage our parking inventory by switching to economic incentives. If you reach two hours, the rate goes from $2 to $5. The average stay now is much lower than two hours, and our, our parking inventory is turning over a great deal. So I do think um, there's good sense in managing our street inventory for street dining with some economic uh, tools. And, and the hard question is how to get that to where a restaurant can afford it, but it still works to manage the inventory. So uh, my friendly amendment would be um, let's do um, 3,000 as our goal and 1,500 this year if you would accept that. But you don't have to. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm thinking on it. So, Your Honor, if I may, um, I'll, I'll speak to where I came up with the number of, of uh, 1,500 and- it, But you, it, have to, you have to take it as a friendly amendment. Oh, or, uh, I'll- Or not. I'll take it as a friendly amendment. Okay. I'll second. Oh. We have like two friendly amendments yeah, and there's no. a motion. We, got too much. we yeah. need to we streamline a little bit. <laughs> okay. Maybe. So could we restate the motion as, um, can you restate the motion? I have his original. Okay. I do. So I have his original. Do you want me to restate it? Yeah. Okay. Let me just look at it. Yeah, it's way back. For those uh, at home, Kelly is, uh, is able to write in Sanskrit, uh, yeah. <laughs> completely illegible to anybody uh, like looking on. <laughs> um, move to adopt the recommendation fees for setting for to be set at fifteen hundred per space with a fifty percent reduction this year. All businesses that operated with dining in twenty 2020 twenty and in twenty twenty one. 
um, namely businesses operating from would re be able to reapply. Um, operations from June 1st to, to Labor Day uh, and then outdoor dining would end by October 16th or before the Halloween parade. And this will be the final year for some res restaurants to give that. So we're giving that warning now. And this has potential for the final year. Many cities are taking 2022 to do things as previously. And 2023, we would start from um, the ground up. And that was seconded by Councilor Denton. Then Councilor Denton moved to amend as a friendly amendment. The square footage for outdoor dining would be $2 per square foot. The minimum previously $2,000 would be $600. And then Councilor Bagley accepted that as a friendly amendment. Um, sorry, just in mm -hmm. interest of, of uh, trying to get us uh, mm -hmm. back on track. So, uh, um, I no, that's not that amendment's not going to do it. Could we restate the amendment as uh, 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 move to uh, amend uh, city suggested fees to three thousand, uh, collecting half of that in first year, with outside dining running through October sixteenth, um, and be available to all uh, participants from last year. Would that capture the heart of it? There's two, that, that does a much better job than what I did. And I apologize for not having this prepared ahead of time, but I was working on it right up till the meeting started. Um, there's two components that are not captured in that. Should we add those on? Let's get through. I mean, I would say that we should, we should probably just vote on the, uh, on the, the fees and the length. Um, and then we'll move to, uh, whether or not we want to, uh, open up uh, other aspects and then potential other aspects to that. Uh, Councillor Denton and then Councillor or Assistant Mayor. I simply ask that you include the square footage fee as well. Okay. Um, Can I do this point of order, Mayor? Yep. Before you take a vote on on what to charge. Um, there was a city council policy adopted in 2012 <coughs> that speaks to area service agreements uh, which pr allow for use of city property for sidewalk cafes providing alcohol service that's where the ten dollars per square foot comes from there is a two thousand dollar minimum that is there and that's been adopted initially by the council in 2012 and ratified uh, a handful of times most notably and recently by this council as part of the larger group policies. of policies on january 24th so i just want to be mindful of that and to put that in context um, there were five area service agreements back in 2019 the last year before covid when uh, the two thousand dollar minimum was achieved by fezziwigs and then there was rerod the district raleigh wine bar and popovers so there is precedent that goes back to 2019 for following this policy so i, I guess it would be a question to bob if you need if, if there was a deviation from the policy that was ratified in january by the council did that make any sense? I think it did, and uh, and I and I believe the answer is that if the city council wants to change a policy now, the council can change it. Okay, just mm -hmm. wanted to bring that forth. The councilor or assistant mayor, and then councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Mr. Smart. This is uh, a question for the city attorney. Um, as most of the public knows, and everyone on here, I own a downtown uh, restaurant, and so I just want to put it on record and ask the city attorney if within voting for this policy and within fees is there is there a conflict um you of course approached the uh, legal department some time ago we discussed this and uh we viewed the city's code of ethics uh, together and uh, i concluded that <clears throat> that there is not a conflict for you to vote on this because it, the ordinance would not affect you differently than it affects other similarly situated people in the city thank you Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. I actually have a question for the city attorney as well. Um, is it possible to request individual votes on the additional amendments to the motion, the friendly amendments, rather than 
just accepting them and moving forward with the vote on the whole? Yes, it is possible. Okay. Um, so uh, I would move to request a vote on the friendly amendment. I think the first friendly amendment and then the second friendly amendment before we move to a motion on the final, um, the actual motion, the initial motion. Um, uh, so before we call a vote, I, I, I guess I, uh, what's the first friendly amendment that we're, we would call up? Yep. Councilor Denton, do you remember? That was for the square footage being uh, set at two dollars. Yep. Per square From ten dollars. Correct. Okay. And the minimum being six hundred. Okay. Correct. Yep. And then, just a point of order on that: those are not uh, fees; those are licenses. Correct. Um. The square footage. <coughs> yes. Yeah. So they're licenses. So they operate differently in that we can't. You know, they're they're set by some. Uh, uh, calculation to determine if they recoup the cost or, or not. So the question is, can we as a council uh, change that, uh, that license uh, cost? Yes, Your Honor, council can change the license cost. Okay. Your Honor, if I could, one Sorry. more consideration to keep in mind that there was discussion of allowing the some restaurants in the higher traffic or travel concern areas to have a shorter period for which barriers would be placed. I can tell you from a operational standpoint, it is much more uh, recommended by DPW to place the barriers all at once and then to remove them all at once. I just asked for that consideration. Mm -hmm. And um, in the interest to be helpful, if, if it thought, if, if it made sense to call a recess and we could uh, take a break to, to figure out the best way to, to move these motions forward. Bob and I would be helpful. Yeah, we've been here for four hours, so why don't we take a five-minute <laughs> recess, and um, if we could come back uh, with a um, a motion and then amendments to that motion in that time period, we just that's going to help this process. So, thank you. I'd be on board with lowering. Got to have a motion.
Oh, I'm setting up here. All right. And we're back. Um, we recessed, got some caffeine, and hopefully have an amendment uh, that both the folks at home and, and we in the council are, are ready to follow. Uh, Andrew, uh, the, the floor is yours, Councilor. I, I got some guidance from the city attorney uh, while we were in recess. So I am going to motion that we adopt the city's manager's. Could, could I start with oh. Your Honor? Could we request the unanimous consent of the city council? To withdraw all pending motions and we yeah. will start again yes. there's a, a, a do we need to move to do that yes yeah, sure so moved second all in favor aye, aye. 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 Okay. all right so i'm going to start Thanks. fresh with a clean slate a motion to adopt the city's manager's recommendations on outdoor dining period at at this point yeah okay second Okay, and now I'm going to immediately make a motion to amend the fee structure to be $3,000 to be charged at a 50% rate of $1,500 per parking space in 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. There was, uh, there was, a uh, there was debate, uh, Councilor Cook? Um, uh, I'm a little bit confused because I thought we were going to take up each motion so, um, as they were before, which the, the initial motion was 1500 at 50% for the year, not 3000 So I'm, I'm confused. So what we just did is that the previous motions that were on the table, by unanimous consent, we set them, uh, we set them aside. Uh, so, Councillor uh, Bagley made a new motion to accept as written the uh, city manager's guidance on outdoor dining. That was the motion. Then he put an amendment on the floor, and that amendment uh, was to take up $3,000, cutting that in half for the first year for $1,500 to be received uh, in this uh, first year. Um. Mr. Mayor, I still have a question about that. Certainly. Um, my understanding in setting aside all the prior motions was that we would bring back each motion individually as they were made before, and that Your we Honor. would be voting on them, not that we would be considering alternative motions or friendly motions, first, friendly amendments first. Your Honor, um, once, once all prior motions were withdrawn, the slate is clean and we're, we're starting over again with the city manager's recommendation as the main motion now it could be that everything was brought forward as it was before with the friendly motion etc but that's not required and and council bagley is doing something a little different is there another question no but can we have uh can i request a roll call vote certainly on the amendment, correct? On the amendment. On the yeah. amendment. Um, Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. Yes. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. Yes. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Councilor Lombardi. Yes. Councilor Blaylock. No. Councilor Cook. No. Mayor McCaffrey. Yes. Motion passes seven to two, the amendment. I have a, a second amendment that the sidewalk spaces be charged at a fee of $2 per square foot with the minimum to be set at $600. Sorry. Bless you. Can you, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that the sidewalk spaces be set at a rate of $2 per square foot. Thank you. With a minimum of $600. Second. Any, oh. Question. Any, Councilor Tabor? Um, would this become permanent? I guess that's a question for the city attorney. Overriding our policy yeah, that we've it, adopted as a council? It would become permanent until the council changed it. Okay. Would you... 
Uh, uh, Councilor Denton, and then Councilor uh, Shaper, would you be more comfortable if that was just for this year? Yes, I certainly would. And would the maker of the motion be comfortable if the amendment was just for this year? Yes. Okay, so at the end of your amendment for 20, the year of 2022? Yes. Okay. Yep. And if I could speak to it. Um, there are a few restaurants in Portsmouth that don't just, that don't have parking spaces, but only have uh, space like this. Um, I know cafes were mentioned. Um, uh, Kevin Dwyer here was speaking earlier. I believe this would fall in his category. So this would impact um, restaurants still. Just a follow-up question um, for the city attorney. And I, we get to make the rules uh, on this, so I understand. Um, but uh, it's always been my understanding that licenses are created, or the, the cost of a license is created by the, or the amount of the license is created by the cost to administer the license. It's a council policy, Your Honor, which is based upon that calculation. Okay. But, but that's but only a council. It's only a council policy. There's nothing specific in There's state not enabling an ordinance legislation for, for licenses. Okay. Okay. So the amendment on the table is to move uh, from $10 a square foot for $2 a square foot in the public realm for the year of 2022. And that would be sidewalks, sidewalks, correct? Yes. For sidewalks. Yeah. sidewalks. Sidewalks, but there were also other, I think uh, Councillor Denton gave an example of uh, Kevin Dwyer's pub, which is a, uh, a street closure, if I believe mm -hmm. correctly. That would also be affected by this or any other street closures uh, that areas exist in the public realm. Well, like the uh, district mm -hmm. is on Vaughn Mall. Mm -hmm. Correct. The, 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 the place is on Vaughn Mall. Correct. Correct. Um, those places that, yep. those, those places that, those that I believe it was five or six that have continuously used the public realm. Mm -hmm. This would, this would include that, um, including loading zones and anything that's not, not a parking space. I would, I would put, um, forth a, a friendly amendment to oh, I'm sorry I'm sorry um, to, to raise that actually a little bit to five dollars so so incrementally just just halving that um, would would you be opposed to that counselor I, I would I would I just am reading into the logic that we initially had of cutting cutting the space the the amount um, from the original and it, it just feels like you know um, and as someone who, to be very transparent, whose business would benefit from, from this lower cost fee, I, I'm one of those. I, I feel like that is a, a very low amount. Um, and so I would, I would have you consider um, just that $3 difference to bring it back to five so that it's, it seems pretty straight ahead, almost 50% cut down from the original um, recommendation from city and current fee structure for that. Councillor Cook. Oh, wait, it's a friendly amendment. You can um, say no. It's I'm okay. not going to take it as a friendly amendment. Okay. okay. Councillor Cook. Uh, this change, would it make it less expensive for uh, restaurants and cafes who are closing streets than it is for those taking up parking spots in front of their businesses? <laughs> I think that would be a city. Does this amendment That's include a, travelways? It's sidewalks and travelways, correct? Correct. Correct. City manager, do you do you know? I th let me take a stab at the question. Um, parking spaces are currently monetized. Sidewalks, when not used by the public, are not monetized. Travel lanes, when not used for this purpose, are not monetized. So, I'm not sure if that helps. On a square footage level, I don't know. I guess that would be the. The, the question that you're asking, Councillor Cook? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the square footage of a parking space? 144. 100, 187 square feet. Uh, oh, shoot. Where's my, where's my Peter Ice Ben Fletcher contingent? 
And if you're listening, is the is the size of a, a parking space 187 square feet or thereabouts? In my research, um, that's correct. Up. Twenty-two feet by eight and a half for uh, parallel parking. Thanks, a little man. less uh, length in, uh, in in lots. Okay. So twenty-two by eight and a half is one hundred and eighty-seven. Can I yep. change my mind after doing some math on the friendly amendment? <laughs> yes. I, I will accept that because that would put a parking space um, size spot at $935. Oh, put it at what? $935. So I agree with the assistant mayor that maybe $2 was a bit on the low side. Sure, You're accepting the $5. Yes. For 2022. And what's the minimum? Uh, six hundred dollars. Oh, it would. <laughs> that like if you had a hundred square feet <clears throat> times five, and it comes out to five hundred dollars, you'd still have to pay an additional hundred dollars to <clears throat> meet that minimum threshold. Is that in my understanding correct? I. W uh, you're you're gonna hate me again. Uh, I would <laughs> I would uh, and, and uh, before, before I make this motion, just I I think. Um, Equity needs to be needs to play and never hear again. I repetitive like I would benefit from just accepting your motion as a, as a business owner. But um, I would put the threshold at at, at fifteen hundred, which is essentially what we're kind of for a parking space, for a parking space which is what we're equating it to. Um, the the can I speak to that? You can. The trouble I have with that is, what if you want to put out two bistro tables? You know, that's far less than a parking spot. But are we allowed to have friendly discussion on, on this? Is that? Uh, not typically. Okay. So I, I guess the, um, we've cut the, we've cut the, right now, or currently as stands, the fee uh, for the outside realm uh, sidewalks and, and, uh, and throughways. Non-monetized. Non-monetized spots is uh, $10 per square foot and uh, $2,000 minimum. If we cut both of those in half, I think we'd get to the point where uh, <coughs> folks are relatively happy. And if you could take that as a friendly amendment. So $5 and $1,000. Yep. For the year uh, of 2022. 2022. Okay. Mr. Mayor, is it possible just to ask the, the city manager for clarification? Because I think there is confusion on this. Um, the sidewalk, please please correct me if I'm wrong. The sidewalk licensee um, are, are also permitted to serve alcohol there is separate fees correct for uh cafes if you want to put a bistro table in an alleyway or chairs that are not connected to serving alcohol that are lower fees correct keep in mind that i've only been here during a pandemic yes so sorry. <laughs> uh, i'm looking at maybe bob to answer that question so for maybe i can answer yeah. my own question hold on um, in, in reference, I, I look at like the the, the sidewalk like um, sidewalk stickers for for like bistro yes. tables outside of like Les, yes. Let Me Son. We had them in the corner of Cup of Joe um, yes. Cafe. I'm sorry, Sears Bakery pays for them out front. So there are sidewalk obstruction. Yes, so, so, I'm sorry, sidewalk obstruction permits. There there, there are those for which, say if a if a which, cafe wanted to just put two bistros. Are not exclusive to the cafe. Yes, and do not allow alcohol. Correct. So I, I just wanted to, to put that um, out there, um, Councillor Bragley, to answer your question. Obstruction, so including restaurant tables, is $75. Um, and then restaurant chairs are $10. So, so those are for restaurants, not cafes, not exclusive to cafes or restaurants, but not serving alcohol and just obstruction. So there are other solutions for restaurants or cafes, again, under, underneath this licensee, the obstruction. That was my objection. So that's ideal. Yep. Perfect. Sorry. I just wanted to. I'm I'd, glad you brought that up. Oh, we saved a, another friendly amendment. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've paid that fee, so I know. Speed this on our way. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So the motion uh, on the table then is to uh, modify or cut in half uh, the proposed uh, cost per foot and uh, minimum uh, fee uh, for the following uh, for the year 2022 
and we will have a, another roll call vote on this. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? No. Council Cook? No. Mayor McEachran? Yes. Seven and two passes. Okay, I, I promised to do better with this one. Uh, another amendment that the time frame end on October 16th for establishments that require Jersey barriers. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? I'll just reiterate the, the reason I chose this date is because I, I want to have DPW to have enough time to get the streets clear for the Halloween parade. And I think the utilization of the outdoor dining goes down around this time. Councilor Cook. Um, while I understand the reasoning behind this amendment, um, I personally believe that we should extend outdoor dining as long as possible in Portsmouth, as long as possible into the holiday season, because we still have a lot of people coming to Portsmouth to dine outside as late as Thanksgiving, and some would like to dine even in December with heat lamps. So um, I personally wouldn't ever want to cut off that opportunity if we can extend it through some of our holidays. Point of order for the, oh, sorry, Councilor. I just wanted to um, agree with Councilor Cook that um, I, th I think that I would not vote for that amendment um, because of the same reasons. I think that depending on whether we might want to have outside dining going farther. Uh, um, city manager, um, without this amendment, when does outdoor dining end? Um, as recommended in the memo, Your Honor, it would be uh, the end of November, the Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend. So bear with November me. 27th. Okay. November 27th. Okay. And so not acting on this amendment, that's what, or voting this amendment down, it would be uh, to the end of November and something that we could take up uh, if it was somehow unseasonably warm, but snow removal does to be a pretty big issue. Oh, Councillor Bagley. I'll just speak to it one more time before we vote. Um, I, I, I enjoy outdoor dining all year round and there are places to do that. Um, you know, some, some restaurants have patios on their own property or whatever. Uh, I also was doing this a little bit as a nod to retailers. Uh, they, they was some request that the weeks leading up to Black Friday, it would be nice to get some of those parking spaces back as well. Doesn't really bring a lot back, but it brings some back. So. Um, I understand the points the other councillors made. Um, I, I'm going to keep my amendment on the table and I'll vote for it, but I can certainly understand the desire to keep this going as long as possible. Roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? No. Councillor Tabor? Yes. Councillor Denton? No. Councillor Moreau? No. No. Councillor Bagley? Yes. Council Lombardi? No. Council Blaylock? No. Council Cook? No. Mayor McEachran? No. Motion fails, two to seven. Okay, I have another amendment, and that's in the section under proposed changes. Item number two, traffic circulation. Any proposed use of the travelway must not impact traffic circulation downtown. Changes that result in a significant impact to traffic pattern or that result in a change in the directional pattern of the street will not be considered. I motion that we strike that language. Second. Any discussion? Uh, just, Councilor Moreau. Could you just say that again? Yeah, read that. Because read that you, motion. you said it a little too fast. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll explain the intent and then I'll read it. So, so roughly there was a couple restaurants that wouldn't be able to do outdoor dining again because they turned one streets into one-way streets. Right. This is the section of the, the, uh, that deals with that. And what we would be doing if this was to pass would be allowing those restaurants to continue outdoor dining in 2022. 
So it's to strike the proposed changes, item number two, traffic circulation. Any proposed use of the travelway must not impact traffic circulation downtown. Changes that result in a significant impact to the traffic pattern or that result in a change to the directional pattern of the street will not be considered. Any other discussion? Who seconded that? Oh, uh, the yes, assistant here. Thank you. Councilor Moreau. I guess who makes the determination, if we left this language in, who would make the determination of a significant impact? Your Honor, I, there would be no determination to be made. Okay. If that amendment passes, there will be no determination. I know. That's what I'm saying. If the amendment doesn't pass, how would it be determined that something would be a significant? I mean, is there a criteria or, or is it there just? There would be um, an area in view permit for okay. the applicant to explain if the request has an impact to traffic. Okay. And if so, they would be required to specify. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, simply state on this, uh, I'll pass the gavel, sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, while I understand the intent uh, is to support uh, businesses uh, continuing on, those traffic patterns did uh, negatively impact uh, some other businesses that we did hear from uh, through the course of, of email. Um, I think it's, uh, it's it's difficult um, to uh, weigh those, um, and I understand uh, that it's uh, an issue of, of fairness. But I, for the same reasons, I can't support closing uh, the changing of the the one-way streets uh, again uh, this year. With that, take a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. Councilor Tabor. No. Councilor Denton. Yes. Councilor Moreau. No. No. Councilor Bagley. Yes. Council Lombardi. Yes. Council Blaylock. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Mayor McCachran. No. Motion passes six to three. All right. Did we get through it? <laughs> I think we did. Well, we still have to the oh, motion. No. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Councillor Cook, before Hi. we vote on this amendment, this hour-long amendment. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say before we vote, I wanted to make a request of our, our city manager to report back on the number of businesses that had, um, after after we go through this process, to, to report back on the number of businesses that chose not to apply for outdoor dining again this year. Um, and I was hoping maybe we could do a survey of those restaurants to find out if what their reasoning was, if it was fee structure in particular. I think that is, uh, we don't need a motion on it. Your Honor, what you need is a, a vote on the original motion as yep. amended. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll <clears throat> have a roll call vote on the original motion as amended. That is with uh, reduced fees, both on the parking spaces and the um, and the square footage, uh, it is with uh, the original, with, with no change to the end date per the city manager, and it is with striking the uh, language that prohibited uh, uh, those businesses that required a travel lane change uh, to be a part of outdoor dining. Correct? All right. So. Uh, with that, we'll do a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Yes. 
Councillor Chaber. Yes. Councillor Denton. Yes. Councillor Moreau. Yes. Councillor Bagley. Yes. Councillor Lombardi. Yes. Councillor Blaylock. Yes. Councillor Cook. Yes. Mayor McCaffrey. Yes. Unanimous. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Moving right along to item number three, the approval of the Deer Street Associate Parking Agreement. Back in 2016, the city entered into a post-closing obligations agreement with Deer Street Associates, which facilitated the city's acquisition of the land upon which the foundry garage now sits. As you may know, the city had a duty under that agreement to deliver a parking agreement to DSA, which would in general terms provide DSA with 68 parking passes in the garage, which DSA would pay for at a market rate. What we're looking to do tonight is to satisfy the city's contractual responsibilities under that post-closing obligations agreement. Uh, the legal department would recommend that the city council authorize the manager to execute a parking agreement with DSA in a form substantially similar to that which is attached and provided in your packet. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Moreau. I'd just like to state that the agreement is indeed what we have, are contractual, contractually obligated to carry out. And there's nothing in it that, uh, yeah, that we can really have a whole lot of effect on based off of the requirements under our original agreement. Any other comment? Um, uh, city Attorney, uh, you have uh, put this uh, on, or through the city manager, put this on the agenda. Could you speak uh, to uh, the city's uh, legal position? I would just make it clear, Your Honor, that both uh, myself and outside counsel uh, would recommend that the council pass this motion. Thank you. Uh, without any uh, further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. The last item under city manager's action items is a request for 64 Vaughn Mall. Uh, with us here tonight are folks from the project, Shane Forsley, and uh, with Novacure, Dean Smith, and Dean was joined by his colleague, Bill Burke. So we're fortunate to have them in the audience. Uh, the council will remember that back in August of 2021, the planning board granted site plan approval for renovation of the building known as the Margison Building and construction of an addition at 64 Vaughn Street. The property has since been conveyed to Novacure, a local medical device company in December of 2021, and Novacure will renovate and use the 42,000 square foot building for their corporate headquarters and their flagship North American headquarters. Um, back in November of 2021, the Construction Mitigation and Management Plan identified temporary encumbrances for project related work, uh, which brings us here tonight, which is uh, the project proponent is seeking a license request to use 35 square feet of land in the Vaughn Mall and 14 parking spaces in the Worth lot for a total of 90 days to begin March 5th and to end June 3rd. And the purpose of this is to set up scaffolding so that the applicant can work on the facade of the building that abuts the Worth lot, and formerly known as the Wailing Wall. So when you take the amount of square foot uh, square footage in the Vaughn Mall um, and add that to the parking space fee, the total license fee would come to $44,257.50. And during the term of this license, it's important to note that the owner will work with the director of public works to create a pilot for the reconfiguration of the worth lot before finalizing the permanent improvements as set forth in a separate development agreement that was approved by the city council on November 15th of 2021. Both legal and planning have reviewed and approved the form of the attached license. Your Honor, I move the city manager be authorized to execute and accept the temporary construction license for the term of March 5. 2022 to June 3rd, 2022, the use of 35 square feet of land in the Vaughn Mall and 14 parking spaces in the work lot as requested. Second. Second. Any discussion? Dr. Bagley. Um, I, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, thanks to the gentleman that had to stay here through the last motion. I appreciate you being in the audience. Um, there was an article in the paper when Novacor decided to move to, to Portsmouth and uh, it might have been the CEO, somebody high up in the company said that, you know, the reason they picked Portsmouth is because of the quality of life in our downtown, especially. Um, Novacor is a company with a, a very important medical mission doing great stuff. And, you know, they, they really could have chosen to 
locate this anywhere in the world. And I think the fact that they chose downtown Portsmouth is a great credit to our city. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and uh, thank the gentleman here tonight. Uh, I know losing parking spaces is, is always a challenge, especially in a, in a lot like worth a lot. But um, I think, you know, we should be cognizant of the fact that, you know, something really great has come to town and we should be proud that they chose us over many other locations. Any other questions or comments? I do have uh, one question. I'd echo all the sentiments that Councilor Bagley uh, shared. Um, my question is around the term of the license. And just for clarity, uh, because this has come up before, uh, is this the expected uh, duration of the project as we know it now? Understanding, um, uh, you know, we could have externalities. Um, and I think we just have to motion uh, to suspend the rules to so the motion. So I move that we suspend the rules. And Second. Or sorry, I can't motion. Oh. <laughs> motion to suspend the rules, Your Honor. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome, Shane. Mayor, uh, Shane Forsley from Hampshire Development Corporation. Uh, we're the GC for the project on behalf of Novacure. Uh, thank you all for your time tonight. And to answer your question, um, the project is targeted uh, with an 18 month duration, um, which we've shrunk down to 15 months um, at this point in time. Um, that uh, period of time that we'd utilize the worth lot would be for uh, the facade and the new construction um, component to, of the building. Um, yeah. So would you expect to need, I, I guess, I just want to set the, uh, the understanding expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, Will you be coming back to extend this, uh, provided that the facade and all of that goes to plan? And mm -hmm. I hope that it does. Um, but uh, if you're on, on time with that, would we expect these spaces to come back uh, into the public realm or will you require those uh, in a future phase of the project? That's correct. So in that 90 day period, we intend to complete the work um, as stated and then get back to land. Great. Thank you, Shane, so much, and appreciate you being here. Thank you all. All right. With that, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nope. Thank you, Mayor. And we need a, oh, no, we don't. All right, so uh, for the consent agenda, I wait the proper motion for adoption of the consent agenda. Move to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And then email correspondence. Uh, wait a sample motion to move and place move on file. to accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. And then we are on to us counselors here. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you. No, um, BNC. sorry, we have a uh, letter from Mr. Uh, James Hewitt regarding the installation of the EV stations. Um, do we need a sample motion? Uh, move to. Uh, Your Honor, I move we accept and place on file. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 A petition from residents of Elwyn Park opposed the installation of sidewalks in the neighborhood. So. Move that we accept and place on file. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, a resubmission of letter from Gretchen Rath, Portsmouth Fabric Company, requesting retailers to be invited to any meetings convened regarding downtown parking. Move we accept and place on file. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the resubmission of letters from various downtown businesses regarding outdoor dining and the use of parking spaces. Move to accept and place on file. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So we have some appointments to be considered uh, under my name. Uh, Duncan McCallum to the Cemetery Committee. Elaine apatak Bucks to the Citywide Neighborhood Blue Ribbon Committee. Kathleen Bodak to the Citywide Neighborhood Blue Ribbon Committee. Lawrence Cataldo to the Citywide Neighborhood Blue Ribbon Committee. William Gatchel to the Citywide Neighborhood Blue Ribbon Committee. Lori Soloway to the Citywide Neighborhood Blue Ribbon Committee. Peter Somsich to the Citywide Neighborhood Blue Ribbon Committee. Ann Weidman as an alternate to the EDC, 
uh, Heinz Sox Schubert as an alternate to the Historic District Commission, Jeff Stern to the Library Board of Trustees, Jason Brewster to the Port Pierce Island Committee, Francesca Marconi Fernald to the Pierce Island Committee, Chris Gallo to the Pierce Island Committee, Steve Marison to the Pierce Island Committee, Stephen Phillip to the Pierce Island Committee, Devin Quinn to the Pierce Island Committee, John Simon to the Pierce Island Committee, Richard Smith to the Pierce Island Committee, Mark Stetner to the Pierce Island Committee, William Townsend to the Pierce Island Committee, <laughs> Kathleen Bergeron to the Portsmouth Housing Authority, Lauren Kranz to the Recreation Board, and Phyllis Eldridge to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. These are all appointments to be considered and will be brought forth at the next meeting. Appointments to be voted. Uh, we have Genevieve Alshiel to the Blue Ribbon Committee on Portsmouth Arts and Nonprofits. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Barakoff uh, has requested that his name be uh, withdrawn. So we will simply be voting uh, on the uh, appointment of Genevieve. If I could have a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we also have, under my name, the resignation of Craig Jewett from the Portsmouth Housing Authority. A sample motion moved to accept his resignation with regret and send a letter to Mr. Jewett thanking him for his service to the city. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Jewett. Uh, appreciate the work that you've done. All right. Um, Proposed citywide goals. Got to find them here because I plan uh, to read them. But a sample motion moved to approve. Uh, let me just uh, read them. Oh, perfect. Paper copies still work sometimes here. Um, so uh, I plan to read these and then uh, move to uh, accept them if there's, uh, we'll have a discussion. Um, but the genesis of this. Uh, was the retreat uh, where we talked about the goals of this council. Um, you know, show me your budget, uh, I'll show you your values. Uh, these are our values as, as, as clearly as we could define them into goals, um, both for ourselves, uh, the general government, uh, and the school board, uh, which has carried over from years previous. We left those uh, as such. So uh, city council goals. Uh, the first, invite and honor input from the community and encourage increased participation, engagement of youth. Two, identify and promote strategies for local business retention and the preservation of affordable commercial spaces. Three, leverage local resources and partnerships to improve and support needs of residents, nonprofit, arts, and cultural community. Four, proactively pursue the integration of sustainability, resilience, and climate change mitigation actions throughout city government and community. Five, diversify and enhance the supply of housing choices. Six, continuously enhance city council best practices to deliver a trusted, transparent, and responsive process. Seven, consistently communicate with community members and stakeholders, respecting channels of communication they prefer and keeping them informed. Uh, under general government, welcome and support diversity in the workplace and community. Nine, maintain financial stability. 10, meet or exceed state and federal legal regulatory requirements, including those for a safe and healthy community and environment. 11, deliver services and programs with courtesy, professionalism, and efficiency. 12, maintain and improve infrastructure to meet needs of the community. Uh, school board, uh, provide an educational environment that affords opportunity, equity, student wellness, and a strong sense of community to every youth. And 14, protect the community through fire and crime cessation and prevention for its residents and business. That's the school board fire police commission goals. Um, so with that, and I'll accept a, a motion uh, to approve. Motion so to approve. Second. Second. And any discussion on these? Oh, uh, Councilor Moreau and then Councilor Bagley. I'd just like to say I really thank the city staff that took everything that we said that day and were able to make it so decisive into a really comprehensive, I'm just impressed. <laughs> Thoroughly impressed, so thank you. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, and I, I just wanna say, you know, the, these goals, I think we, we, had a, we talked for a long time to come up with them, and uh, we really got to see that engagement piece in action over the last, uh, week or so with the community and you know we really value uh, when you reach out to us through emails um, through the contact all city councilor uh, button on the website your feedback is really important and the more of it we get the better informed our decisions will be made 
Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? So just so uh, everyone is aware, uh, these will align into our budget and they will be mapped to items in the budget uh, of which we will be spending tax dollars uh, looking to achieve. So everything will be tied back to a goal uh, here. Um, so this is a, a budget document as much as it is goals and hopefully an effort for us to be held accountable. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, the last uh, was a, um, uh, I was lucky enough to attend a opening of uh, Families First, which has moved for those. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, was there a comment? Uh, actually, a motion, Mr. Mayor, to extend beyond 10.30 p.m. Or is it 10.30? It is. Like Just 13 seconds it. past 10.30. <laughs> but all right. We'll keep it. Uh, I'll accept a motion to move past 10.30. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> all right. We are officially past 10.30 on my anniversary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love her gift. <laughs> so the, the final item under my name, um, I was uh, fortunate to be able to go to the opening of Families First new um, facility. Uh, it's off of, um, well, it's behind uh, Greenleaf. Um, it's where the old school gym was uh, quite a while ago. Um, and. Uh, it came up in conversation, uh, a request that there be a, uh, a coast bus stop closer uh, to where that um, uh, is located on Greenleaf. Right now, it would have to go all the way up um, uh, past Boarama, take a right uh, past um, uh, Crossroads and back there, and it's, it's really difficult for a bus to turn around. And what I thought um, about this is one, um, uh, for a report back on feasibility of this, but also how can we give input to transportation and coast in terms of bus stops and their general availability within the community. We talk a lot um, about housing um, and transportation is a part of that. Uh, but I'm simply re requesting a report back on that. But happy to have comments. I see Councilor Moreau itching well, to make one. <laughs> uh, just for the record, I actually am not only an owner at Greenleaf Woods Drive where Families First is now located, but I also sit on the board of directors. Okay. So I have probably will have a lot of ideas and probably can help on that because I think stopping buses on that narrow road is going to be really difficult too. So I have some other thoughts on that. So I would love to be part of that conversation to help. Absolutely. So uh, the goal first of this is, is simply to feasibility uh, around how could that be made accessible, but then the process, you know, as we are changing the city uh, to make sure that we are helping Coast serve our community, um, you know, we do uh, help Coast, but would want to make sure that we're able to offer uh, some thoughts uh, uh, around those bus stops. Uh, Councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, do we have a representative in, to the Coast Bus Service. I know in the past the City Council had a representative. Uh, we haven't had a, a City Council rep in the in the recent past. Currently, Parking Director Ben Fletcher is on the Coast Board on behalf of the city. Thank you. Okay, that could be a part of the report back in terms of the process with Coast and how we're getting updates uh, to the Council on Coast. Um, all right, but I won't go on. Any longer appreciate the time on that. Um, Councillor Tabor, <clears throat> Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I'm proposing a motion that the city manager is authorized to take any and all actions necessary within her judgment to cause the city of Portsmouth to become party to the joint powers agreement of the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire as presented, which became effective October 1, 2021. Second. Okay. Um, I'm advancing this um, with the support of the Energy Advisory Committee that met February 9th and voted unanimously to recommend the council vote to join DPCNH. It's uh, the first step on a journey to aggregation of our electric demand, give re residents um, a way to buy greener power and maybe cheaper power as well. Um, it's important to note that this step is just joining the coalition. We would have to come back to the council um, 
and have a vote to develop a community power plan, which is required by statute, to send any, anything more in motion. And what we can do between now and then is go out, um, explain this to the public, and we'd like to do a survey to see the public's interest and appetite uh, to pay for a menu of, say, 50% green power, 100% green power, a series of options. So <clears throat> tonight's step is not a commitment to buy power from CPCNH or to become the default provider or anything like that. It's just to join the coalition. It doesn't cost the city anything except some staff time. And um, <clears throat> we gain a seat on the board of directors I'm happy to say that Kevin Charette of our Energy Advisory Committee has volunteered to fill that board seat. Um, <coughs> three benefits, and then we'll go to a vote uh, and discussion. I think it's the single biggest thing we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. <coughs> Cities and towns that have done this, like Marin County, California, have gone from 20% renewable elect to electricity to 50% in just four to five years. I think CPCNH will, an aggregation will create more competition among suppliers and states that have allowed aggregation to really accelerate have shown over time lower overall rates in their, in their state. And we can be part of driving that. And lastly, um, as CPCNH represents right now 20% of the residents of the state, and that will grow. Uh, they can be a buying cons consortium <coughs> that will expand renewables, create a market for hydro, solar, wind, and I think that shapes our energy future, and we can be part of that too. Happy to Thank answer you. any questions. Councilor Tabor, any questions? Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to voice my full support for this motion. Um, I recently joined uh, the committee with Councillor Tabor, and I, I think that the committee has done exemplary work in reviewing the whole process around community power and the community, community power coalition. It's important to remember that we're just giving ourselves the option at this stage to enter into agreement. We're not actually ultimately agreeing to buy power yet. We're just giving ourselves that option. And anybody who's been buying power on the market lately or has had to switch um, their power supplier recently knows that it's very difficult to make these decisions. A lot of residents face a difficult decision when trying to find uh, renewables uh, and a good renewable supplier <coughs> for their energy. Um, this allows us to provide them reassurance that they're actually getting renewable energy when they choose a supplier through potentially through community power if we choose to go that way. And it allows us to make sure that we offer um, that alternative to our residents. So Councilor I would urge Cook. everyone to support this. Councilor Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just want to thank Councilor Tabor for bringing this forward. Any step to move forward in um, climate change mitigation um, to make us more of a net zero city, um, I appreciate that effort. And, and I do want to remind the citizens that we haven't made any decisions that cost anything yet. We can <coughs> leave this agreement whenever we choose, so nothing has been spent yet. Thank you, Councilor Tabor. Thank you. It's a thank you. All right, well, uh, with that, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Councillor Tabor. Uh, Councillor Denton, we Denton. have what's in? Uh, I'm seeing <laughs> outdoor I dining make a different fees. Motion. Okay, <laughs> oh, okay. All right, different so. motion. So Kelly's going to have to work hard <laughs> on this. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to motion for city staff to work with the fee schedule study committee to develop fees for food service establishments on city property that violate the composting requirements of the distribution of single use disposables on city property ordinance. I could say that again. It's a modification of what was originally in front of you. 
Yeah. So again, it's motion for city staff to work with the fee schedule study committee to develop fees for food service establishments on city property that violate the composting requirements of the distribution of single use disposables on city property ordinance. Second. So regardless of any actions that anyone takes in the next 30 years, sea levels is gonna rise one foot by 2050. And food waste is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases worldwide because methane is dozens of times more potent than carbon dioxide is. However, um, the expansion of outdoor dining on city property gives us the city an opportunity to actually go ahead and enforce some of the 2019 single use disposables on city property ordinance that requires a number of things, including composting. And by passing this motion, it simply allows the fees committee to start actually um, allowing fees as allowed by the ordinance to go forward. Um, many restaurants currently spend up to $1,000 a month on composting between having the, if I remember correctly, if you have a single bin of compost picked up five days a week, that's $450 a month. And then the actual uh, composting disposables, the flatware, the utensils, that could be over $500 a month as well. So you have some smaller restaurants spending $1,000 a month, larger restaurants spending far more. And if we could have an impact by starting to enforce this ordinance on food establishments that use uh, city property, whether it be parking spaces, sidewalks, what have you, to either level the playing field for those that are currently good stewards and that do compost or encouraging those that currently do not compost to start composting i think it's a step in the right direction and that's there's a second on that second yes, council okay. okay. any discussion <laughs> councillor blaylock i think you are um I appreciate Councilor Jen bringing this up. I, my only concern was be, it would be to add fees to restaurants at this time. Um, I mean, obviously we're still in this pandemic, we're still wearing masks. I understand I've, you know, we've composted at my restaurant for several, several years, um, just in doing good due diligence to try to treat the earth better and, you know, take care of the world around us. Um, but yeah, that would be my only concern is that we were adding a, a cost um of operation for those restaurants but i do appreciate um enforcing this you know what i mean so we move forward with composting and encourage that as much councillor blaylock uh, oh uh, councillor or assistant mayor um i would also like to show support i think that it's also important that um at some point when we when we look through the next master plans and and potentially the next round of cip is that we look at um compost compost and throughout our city. Um, Councilor Denton and I have had several conversations where um, it, it's hard sometimes to justify for, for a small business to justify spending the increased cost, especially when the cost of goods, um, especially disposables, have gone up in some cases well over 100 to 200 percent. And the cost of compostable goods are even more than that to justify as a small business spending that money when essentially, especially if it's, say, a cup of coffee or, you know, anything like that when the customer is going to go out and throw that into the trash can that's provided them by the city and therefore almost completely waste any due diligence done by the business. So I would think that um, especially when we get into the climate action plan and we get into the sustainable committees, we look at some resources that the city can put in to help increase um, compostability and recycling within our test, downtown and city and business department. Yeah. On that note, the only uh, or the only concern I have uh, with this from a, uh, a fee standpoint is, um, as I understand it right now, there's only really one private outfit that collects uh, composting uh, in the city. So I would hope that there would be, you know, I would feel more comfortable about um, increasing penalties or, uh, you know, making penalties if this was a service that the city provided or there was, you know, other competition in there. but. I, I, I appreciate the spirit of which the, uh, this is offered um, and 
hope that we can work um, you know into this uh, a broader discussion uh, on how we make composting uh, make sense uh, for businesses but also Portsmouth uh, more broadly but I think this will get to that uh, this discussion would be a part of the fee committee mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Councilor Bagley. Yes, so uh, my item tonight is uh, Elwyn Park Traffic Calming and Pedestrian Improvements. And my motion would be to move TSM-17-PL-59 dash 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 Elwyn Park Traffic Calming and Pedestrian Improvements from fiscal years 24 and 25 in the CIP to fiscal year 23 as a $1.66 million dollars to be bonded second so uh we heard from some residents both for and against this tonight um i think it's important that our elementary schools are, are as equitable or, or treated the same in in all three locations as, as we can and you know my daughter went to little harbor i've been to the other two elementary schools a number of times and for a pedestrian, especially a small child, walking up to the school, uh, you know, <clears throat> Ellen Park, the Dondero School, the, the situation there kind of, in my opinion, falls short. I thought it'd be important to move this forward for several reasons. Um, what's in the CIP is just a, a placeholder. So if it's in 24, if it's in 25, that doesn't mean it's going to happen in 24 or 25. It means that next year, in theory, it'll be voted upon and adopted in the budget, but it could also get pushed out another year. And as we heard from some speakers tonight, or we saw in some emails, you know, people have been waiting for this from when their kids were in kindergarten to now they're off to college. Uh, we did get, I'm just gonna read very briefly, um, a snippet from a letter to the editor uh, written by a parent when her child was in kindergarten. And, and the snippet is, walking towards Dondero, there's about four feet of clearance separating us from passing cars. Little kids can cover that distance in one stumble, and little kids are almost continuously stumbling, especially when they're trying to maneuver in clunky snow boots and bibs, encumbered by backpacks. Parents, were all busy. I honestly don't know how those of you with multiple children handle it all, and I applaud you. But we are the village, and we have to be better at looking out for each other. It cannot take a tragedy to remind us that we generally care for our neighbors. The, as I mentioned, this letter to the editor was written when her child was a kindergartner. They just entered, well, they're just about finished with the eighth grade. Um, we heard from s some speakers tonight that, you know, we need more time to build consensus. Uh, there's a report that was issued in 2019. I, I hope you all had a chance to look at it. You know, there's, there's over 70% consensus in the neighborhood. This, this has been going on for literally decades at this point. Um, the other point, which is more of a technical point, is we're planning to resurface the roads in Owen Park, half of them. If we were to do this next year or the year after, we'd have some sunk costs where we were digging up roads that we just resurfaced to put sidewalks in um, if we did in fact vote for them or if the next council did vote for them. So I, I wanted to move this forward, understanding the challenges it puts on our public works and finance department, primarily because I think it's a, a very important issue it's the safety and equity of our children at the elementary school level in my opinion thank you your honor councilor Lombardi. uh i have a question and one of the issues that was brought up by uh one resident at least was that he felt that he was going to lose some of his property um what is the status of the right of way, the street right of way and the property lines? Um, is that clear? Are they, are they, will they have to take property to so, uh, do this? Uh, it, uh, Peter Wright should answer this, but uh, the, the short answer is uh, no. Um, but the right of way extends into what people typically view as their own lawn. When I became a homeowner, I was surprised to find out I didn't own all of my lawn, uh, as most homeowners uh, find that, that out. This would be an example of, uh, while it, you're currently maintaining it, uh, the city does have access to that, and it is in the city right away. I would imagine that that is the plan for the, mm -hmm. uh, the, Good. 
the yeah. the uh, the sidewalk. But uh, one gentleman's point of not being able to park uh, his cars or four cars in a, a garage would probably be true because it would encumber the sidewalk uh, in that case if, it, right. if the cars were going as far down as they were. That's what I thought, but I wanted to be sure. Councilor Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I had the pleasure of attending Don Darrow School as a child. Um, I had the pleasure of riding my bicycle around that neighborhood and growing up in the woodlands. Me and the mayor spent a lot of time on McKinley um, Road there. Um, I also moved right next door to Little Harbor in sixth grade, so I had a very good, quick uh, perspective. Um, I will say the entrances to Little Harbor and, and um, New Franklin are much safer than Dundero. Um, that, that neighborhood, it's, I know this, uh, we've always been a plan to make it safer. It, it was a lot quieter 20 years ago. Um, I've seen the traffic going down McKinley, going into the school. Um, I'm also friends with some of the neighbors that are right, that are about right at the entrance. Um, and this, the, the image that Andrew ba Councilor Bagley just described of you know, a young child stumbling or something on his way to school, um, a sidewalk's gonna make that much safer. Um, you know, you separate that, you create a curb, you, you know, the cars, now they have to go up on the curb, you know, there's just a whole, it makes it a lot safer. Um, I've seen the white lines that are there now, you know, and I understand that cars are always parking on it. If you go on Google Earth, you'll probably find a car blocking that back, that, that bike lane. Um, so I'm glad this is in the CIP. I noticed that it did get moved back before in the CIP. Um, my only question would be, did it get moved back previously because there was not a consensus on this plan? The, the, the general answer to the question is it was just a reprioritization of items within the CIP. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Councilor Cook. Oh, and then Councilor Murrow. Sorry, I gotta write them down. <laughs> Getting lazy here. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I support this motion uh, because I think it's part of a bigger picture of providing walkability to all residents of Fort Smith within their neighborhoods. Uh, Elwyn Park uh, is difficult on the really busy streets as far as walking goes. Um, it was obvious to me um, when I was walking door to door and meeting residents in Elwyn Park that the traffic was was vibrant is what I would say, and could be very dangerous, especially for young children. Um, I think that we've put this off um, more than once. It's time to consider um, improving uh, pedestrian walkability outside the center of the city, especially, and Elwyn Park should be a priority for us because it's so close to Don Darrow School. Councilor Moreau. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to check with the city manager and possibly with uh, Director Peter Rice as to one, are we going to have any issues with our percentage of bond that we always try to stay under that percentage? Because I can't remember now off the top of my head where we are if we move this to this year. And two, whether or not we're going to have any issues with staffing to actually get it done within fiscal year 23. So I would ask, I would need for the finance folks to report back uh, what adding 1.6 million would do. The net, we don't, we want to stay within 10%. Right. And and That's we were, we're hovering around the 8.19 exactly. or 8.2 percent, give or take. Um, we can certainly provide that in a report back, um, perhaps in an email as quickly as possible, so the council has that well in advance of the March 7th meeting. And I'm sorry, the second question had to do with uh, uh, whether or not resources. Yeah, whether or not we have the resources to actually make it happen. Yes. That one I'm <laughs> going to have to turn to Peter for help. Um, good evening again. Um, staffing is a challenge for a lot of our projects, but it, staffing isn't really what drives the schedule on this. There are two drainage areas that impact um, the plans for sidewalks in this area. So that will probably have a larger impact uh, on the project than, than our staffing availability. Um, the, the paving work we're gonna do is we're gonna stay away from the two areas that were recommended for sidewalks, uh, which is McKinley and Harding. 
uh, and then the, the paving will be done on either side of that or done on the, the south side of that. So it's not precluding um, the work. There's, there's additional design work that would need to be done. The mayor is correct. Uh, the right of way um, is more than adequate to handle um, the sidewalk addition without having to do any takings. Um, but it's, it's a matter of, you know, it needs to be designed, it needs to be uh, coordinated with other work, and, um, you know, there is, there is a process even though um, there was um, more consensus around you know, a, a revised plan, there still is a lot of dialogue going on uh, with residents out there relative to acceptance of the proposed project. And, you know, like all our projects, we try to, to work with folks and make this as um, acceptable as possible. So staffing um, is a challenge, and it always will be a challenge, uh, but we balance the work we do, and, and you know, if, if it was lined up to move forward, it would happen, but there's still pieces that need to be put in place before it can go forward this year. Councilor Lombardi. Uh, another question, I think, for Peter is that many times when you do street work, you also do some utility work. Is that... Um, Part of the plan too? No, there's there's uh, there's no plan to do utility work out there, okay. other other than drainage. Yeah. So the drainage is is the one piece that's kind of holding us up. Mm -hmm. So you're going to install uh, storm drain. There's some in that. existing infrastructure that needs to be increased in size. Yeah. And the outlet, which is going to go across um, Elwyn Road uh, to discharge into the um, Urban Forestry Center. Is part of that work so we're going to be doing a side the Ellen Road side path is going to start the drainage outlets and then we're going to work our way up so it's it's a combination of a couple of things but we're, we're planning on moving forward uh, with getting the design work going associated with this and it's so the project's going to be moving forward it's just not going to move forward all this year okay. thank you assistant mayor um, I'm not exactly sure if this would be a motion or a request or um, based on what Director Peter Rice said, um, is it possible to, before we potentially vote on this, table this or, or the next steps to schedule a walk, to schedule a walk around the neighborhood? Would, would you be, I don't know if that's a friendly amendment or if that's just a, a, a separate motion to, to try to um, schedule potentially a walk around the neighborhood to try to get that, some more general consensus um, before voted on this motion. So we'll have to t we'll have to move the vote on this motion out because I don't think uh, we'll be able to get down there uh, tonight. Uh, <laughs> Great, we're going. Um, but yeah. if we were to say uh, March March fifth, which is a Saturday that morning, um, is that something that? Uh, looking at uh, calendars there. I believe that's the last weekend of school vacation right. Yes. Okay. right yeah next week is school vacation so we're gonna have yep. a lot of people that are oh, yes. yeah. that are out uh, myself included um, for school vacation um, so we might have a um, if, if I may um, make a suggestion um, the Budget process, um, you know, there is another bite at the apple in terms of, I mean, you have the, the next meeting that you could adjust this at, um, so there's time to, to, to look at this further. And then also in the budget adoption process, you can again uh, bring this forward um, in, in terms of um, adjustment. So there is another opportunity to move this forward. And, and where there is such a need for the design process and we do have current funding available to start the design process um, to move the sidewalks along um, it, it's the process is not being held up by scheduling um, this money at this moment um, there's we you know we can still make forward motion on this project have a public process have the have the site walk um, with the opportunity uh, to bring it instead of it being 24 25 the funding likely wouldn't be needed until 24 anyway so the design process could continue to move on and you could firm things up and, and, and have a bit more consensus um, at least on the from the council standpoint on how to move forward um, so I just just offer that up as a, a potential path forward so uh, just to 
clarify that path forward, we would split out in the CIP uh, monies that would be associated with uh, the design portion, and then in 24, put the uh, the bulk of the money for the implementation. Is that a suggestion? The, there is currently ninety thousand dollars available for uh, the starting the design and getting it moved forward. So that I believe would be enough to to really firm up the location of the sidewalk and to you know to clearly show you know how it's going to be implemented and then in 24 the monies uh, to implement could be uh, allocated so just to clarify that money doesn't that money it already exists it doesn't need to be appropriated in a CIP yeah it's, it's available monies okay so if we could um, somehow you know I understand the uh, frustration of folks that uh, feel as though this is ongoing um, for a very long time but I also know that it's in, until we the the process of actually planning this, there's a lot of people that will not provide their their input as uh, in a real or in a non theoretical sense. So if we start getting that that feedback, as we've done with say Bartlett Street uh, right now, um, I think that would be a, a good not compromise because it's actually moving the process forward, but get more. Uh, buy-in from the neighborhood and a realization of what exactly is there with the money to stay in 2024 uh, because we wouldn't start the project before then is there any way that we could I guess sorry I'm, no, that's my no? <laughs> I'm not doing my job as mayor I'm talking um, <laughs> uh, but is there any way that we could um, more clearly show that those funds have been identified for this purpose for the public in uh, in in the CIP or, or anywhere else for this. And I've looked at maybe finance. It, I, I have to to look to Andrew, but I believe it was previous years um, CIP funding, and we could get the the um, where that funding was when it was allocated, and I believe it was one hundred and fifty thousand originally, Andrew. Okay, so I, there was there was monies originally allocated to start the design. Some of those monies were spent. There's a there's ninety thousand available in the fund at this time. Okay. Your Honor, um, Councillor Bagley, I I guess I would move that uh, we table this so that we can schedule a walkabout, continue discussion with city staff, and. I think it's pretty clear that at least some of us on the council would like to see this move forward as expeditiously as possible. Um, so I don't know that we need to pass a motion tonight for anything. We, we can gather more data, but uh, my position that this should be a, a priority project is, hasn't changed, but it sounds like taking a vote tonight may be a bit hasty. But well, we do need to vote to table it unless you, repul you re remove the motion. Or he could withdraw his motion. I'll, I'll, re I'll rescind my motion. Okay. Second. And we're and good. We and we'll, well, work we, schedule, wait, uh, <laughs> we'll work to schedule. We'll work to schedule an on-site per the assistant mayor's uh, request, um, and we'll do that uh, with the coordination of the council and not to align with uh, school vacation. Councillor Cook. I just had a point of, of clarification. Um, just because we allocate the funds. For fiscal year 23 that doesn't mean that they have to move forward right and bond them immediately until the project is ready is that accurate that is accurate okay. it, it would impact our debt schedule so we would right. want to have it in the appropriate year right. okay uh Councillor Lombardi and Councillor Tabor, the floor is yours for a report back regarding proposed cargo facility at the trade port Thank you. Um, well, Councilor Tabor and I met with PDA Director Paul Breen, um, and this meeting was pretty much to help me learn more about the work of the PDA. We discussed varied development areas of the trade port, the uses of allowed areas, and some of the potential new areas of development. It's a, it's a pretty amazing place um, and pretty diverse. Uh, but we then focused most on the proposed development of the uh, cargo facility um, because that's 
that's the real big question out there at the moment and um, where it is in the planning process at this point there's an agreement to explore the feasibility um, and this is at a very very early stages and will t and uh, will take into consideration among other things environmental impact traffic and noise studies something oh the folks are just leaving oh okay uh, the, the project comprises two sites for warehousing. Uh, one is currently the property of Hangar 227, a large empty Air Force hangar in the middle of the runway. And then the other is the uh, back 40, they call it, the apron at the Newington end of the runway, where a large facility of probably 250,000 square feet uh, is proposed. Um, I know the newspaper article had some other numbers in there, but I think uh, what what uh, Mr. Breen said was it'll probably end up around 250,000 feet. Um, he could not talk about the potential tenants, um, and he said that uh, because the project would be built by a developer, it is a and it's at a secondary airport. It is more attractive to be a niche to a uh, niche provider than a corporate entity. Um, what that means is that um, the, well, the big providers, the big transport companies, are are less interested, but that doesn't exclude them. Um, he said that the they the corporate tenants would prefer um, primary airports over secondary ones, such as peas, and airports that do not have large percentage of their distribution area being the ocean. They'd rather have, be surrounded by land where they can do their deliveries. Um, all that being said, we still do not know who the tenant would be. And, um, and he said he doesn't know, but he probably has a list somewhere. <laughs> um, but he thinks that it more likely would be a niche tenant that could provide service to smaller local businesses and regional, local and regional businesses rather than lar large corporations. He said that a niche provider would probably be the last mile terminal facility. So um, they would be using uh, what he calls sprinter vans rather than tractor trailers in their deliveries. And so the impact on the um, road infrastructure would be uh, that rather than uh, semis. Uh, he also uh, said, and as he said in the newspaper, he thinks that the, the facility could be supported by daytime air traffic and um, rather than nighttime flights. And there's still a need for highway traffic studies as well as environmental and noise studies um, and uh, I th they're also talking about um, the effort to increase commerce through our, our port, the, the water port, um, as well as um, encouraging wind en energy uh, in the ocean. So um, it's a big project. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, we did not talk about uh, how many jobs it might employ um, or what kind of what the quality of those jobs are um, but um, I think it would be quite a few jobs so that's my understanding from our our conversations I don't know John if you have more to add to that um, yeah Councillor Lombardi's done the play-by-play -play. I'll try to do a little color commentary um, I think our takeaways were right now the air freight industry is really rapidly changing and there's this bubble of demand for warehouses next to a runway where the plane can come in, unload, stock inventory on shelves and um, so these developers are building this with a list of potential tenants um, 
and um, they want to move very quickly. Um, what we heard from from Mr. Breen was the notion that this is like a Federal Express hub with dozens of flights at night and everything is urgent, has to be out the next day, is is completely the opposite of what is actually going to happen there. This is going to be, you have five units, five widgets, and you draw down that inventory for local delivery, and then you replenish it. So you're talking about a number of flights per week, not per day, and mostly daytime flights. So I think a lot of the speculation that we've been seeing is, is a little off the base. Um, and the next steps will be, they'll come with a conceptual plan to P's. We, we sort of delegate our planning department responsibility to the trade port for projects over there. So the P's board will hear the whole conceptual plan in probably May. And that's the point where public input could come in. Um, the other commissioners, Peggy Lampson and uh, commissioner from Greenland, are very concerned about congestion and noise and air flights. And they're insisting on traffic counts and traffic studies, which will happen. Um, so we'll learn more about it. it it's a, it has the potential to be very large. <coughs> but it will start off in, in phases. So that's what we know at this point. Yeah. Thank you both. Any questions? Councilor Moreau? Um, <clears throat> anything that happens at Pease also does come to the planning board here in Portsmouth. Ultimately, yeah. Yeah, ultimately we do get to at least review it and hear from residents. So, because I do think <clears throat> one of the things we really need to keep in mind is they might have a certain tenant that they're kind of building this for now, but it's going to be there for a long time, so it doesn't mean other tenants can't move in. So I think we have to be conscientious as every you know yep. time we you know change an ordinance or whatnot. This is for the long haul, and it could be a smaller hub for one of those bigger companies at some point yeah, and need more. So and just want to make sure that we stay weary. It could of be multiple that. tenants. It could be. So I just think we need to make sure we're weary of that and stay on top of it. Yeah. Council Barty. Um, the, one of the things about it is that um, anything that goes into peas is regulated by the FAA. Um, they they are responsible for uh, the zoning. Peas is responsible for the zoning of that whole property, um, and it comes comes under the rules of the FAA. Well. Thank you both for bringing that. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> questions there. The PDA is something that, you know, even when you're on the council for a couple of years, it's still somewhat mysterious. Uh, I know that we're planning um, a visit there as a council. I think that will be good. Um, and I think at, at some point to have a, uh, a sit down uh, with the PDA would be in order to discuss uh, this. Uh, but thank you for the, the update. Um, and. We will move on to <clears throat> Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Cultural uh, plan for Portsmouth. Yes. Um, I move to approve of a new cultural plan for Portsmouth to be commenced in 2022 based on a scope of work outlined by the Portsmouth Arts and Nonprofits Committee, noting that the request for development of a cultural plan in 2022 was included in the committee's 2021 year-end report to the City Council on December 20th, 2021, and request that the City Manager identify the appropriate funding source for said cultural plan. I'm Second. Going, thank, you. thank you. I'm going to pass my cultural plan down to the Council so you, everyone can see the last cultural plan that we had for the City of Portsmouth, which is in 2002. Mm. So it's been 20 years, 20 years since we adopted a cultural plan. Now, the, sig the significance of the cultural plan is it's really what we would call a strategic plan for culture and nonprofits um, in Portsmouth. And part of the reason that we haven't revised and adopted a new cultural plan 
is that we haven't had a mechanism to do that truly at the city level until the last few years. We used to have an arts committee, a standing arts committee, the Arts Speak, that worked on the provisions of this cultural plan. And when they achieved the goals that were outlined in it, Arts Speak dissolved. Uh, so as a result, no one, um, there was no one organized to reinstitute a new cultural plan and a new strategic plan and vision. The Arts and Nonprofits Committee um, started meeting as a result of the pandemic and made this recommendation to, to the city council. Um, we are a little bit behind, clearly. Um, usually you don't wait 20 years to develop a cultural mm -hmm. plan. Many of our major arts organizations in the city um, aren't even mentioned in our existing cultural <clears throat> plan because they didn't exist at that time. So it's important to remember that you know cities change and we need to redevelop new strategic plans as we change and evolve. I wanted to highlight for all of you the um, Americans for the Arts um, study findings with regard to the contribution of arts and nonprofits cultural organizations to the city of Portsmouth. Um, in Portsmouth, spending total spending by nonprofit arts and cultural organizations and for by their audiences exceeds $58 million in a year. And that, that estimated revenue that that brings in to our government is over $3 million in a year. Um, and yet we don't have a clear plan for how to support them in the long term. And many of these organizations have been severely negatively impacted by the pandemic. So I ask that we move forward in supporting um, a cultural, new cultural plan for the city of Portsmouth. And that, as I said in the motion, that we have the Arts and Nonprofits Committee develop the scope of work around that plan. Any other comments? I uh, just have to say, since this is your anniversary, my wife, Ellen Feinberg, was part of the uh, oh. committee that um, worked on that plan. This is, uh, well, um, oh, man, Mr. Sir, there's, uh, yeah, this, some, uh, some good memories uh, in that um, Ellen did a, a good job, but it is time to, uh, to dust that off and um, specifically, uh, this is a, a comprehensive document um, as I spoke to, to Kate a, a few months ago uh, on the form of when she joined uh, this, she mentioned this and members of the, uh, um, the committee have uh, stated as uh, such that this is vital uh, in order to help strategically plan uh, for nonprofits um, and how we would expect to get them uh, the funds that they need to survive and, and serve others. Uh, so uh, again, with the, uh, the community campus acquisition, I think this is a perfect time uh, to do this if it wasn't 20 years, but um, it is. So uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Nope. All right. Okay, we've made it through most of this. Approval of grants and donations, the acceptance of a wellness reward, reward for $2,000. The sample motion moved to approve and accept the wellness reward as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I laugh because this could not possibly be given to me based on what I've been eating for lunch uh, <laughs> the last uh, few weeks. Um, and then city manager's informational items. Report. Your Honor, we, uh, as referenced at the February 7th meeting, uh, we're providing a report back information on funding options and a little bit more background relative to levels uh, level two and three electric charging stations. Uh, quick comment, if I may, Your Honor. Yep. Uh, thank you for the report back. It's on the agenda to be discussed at this Thursday Sustainability Committee meeting. And I just wanted to let everyone know, I know the financial staff have left, finance department, but um, there's a chance that I may be motioning to add the 130,000 plus the cost of a new 480 volt transformer um, at the CIP meeting. But first I'm gonna discuss it with the sustainability committee. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Denton. 
We are on to miscellaneous uh, business, including uh, business remaining unfinished. Previous meeting, we have the citywide neighborhood committee meeting, meeting minutes of January 26th. Accept the motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And any other miscellaneous business besides, I'm going to apologize to my wife again. Uh, <laughs> but I second that. All right. We all wish your wife a happy anniversary. Yeah, happy anniversary. Right. What's left of it? Well, uh, all those, uh, uh, except the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Good night, Portsmouth. Thank you.